Hey everybody, I'm Mark Christ. And I'm Eric Smart from Music City Trucks. Now coming up, you can check out the full build on our 1985 Chevy K10. Yep, we started with this and we ended up with this. This is our tribute to the truck from the TV show, The Fall Guy, that we like to call the Faux Guy. Check it out. You're watching Power Nation. Well, we came down the road about two and a half, three miles to Mullins Construction and Concrete. And I think Stovall put us onto the right guy with the square body. I think this is gonna be our truck. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, we already know you don't wanna start with a truck that's too rough. Mm -hmm. And you definitely don't wanna start with a truck that's too nice because you don't wanna mess it up. Yeah. So hopefully this is the right truck and hopefully he's willing to sell it. Let's go check it out. Let's do it. Well, this must be the truck. Oh yeah, you must be Chad. I am. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you, Mark. Nice Brandon. Nice, nice to meet you, Brandon. What are y'all looking for? Well, something like this. Tell us about the truck. Oil, it's a 85 Chevrolet square body. Just original truck. It originally came out of Decatur, Alabama. A farmer had it, bought it new, and I think about the only thing he did with it was pull a gooseneck trailer. And we bought it about four years ago, and just me and my son just play with it, have a good time in it. What's wrong with the truck? It's old. <laughs> <laughs> It's got a little rattle. We don't know what we never investigated it in the um, like flywheel torque converter or something like that. It seemed like it's getting loose or something. When I bought it, I thought the motor would blow up in a few days and uh, it's been going for four years. <laughs> so you can't kill it. Are, you yeah. can't kill it. <laughs> I pulled concrete trucks with it. I've done everything. Yeah, I see there's a, some bubbling on the cab corner. Woo will look solid though in there. You said you think the dude towed a gooseneck with it most of its I life? I do. That bed, bed is in great nice. shape. I put that line X in it as soon as I got it. Yeah. Wow. And it was such a nice bed. If you didn't I mean, have that, I mean, the worst part's the dent in the tailgate. And maybe that cab corner that's missing right there. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Pop the hood. All right. All right. It's got a 350 in it. and. Be honest with you, we ain't touched this truck in a year. Okay. <laughs> you think it'll fire up? I don't know. Give it a crank. See if it see if it'll fire up. All right, here we go. Hear that, hear that knock. It's like torque converter or flex plate or something. I mean say it had a diesel in it. <laughs> well, we've walked around the truck, we've seen it, we've heard it run but I know you didn't say it was for sale. Is it viable? Yeah, it's viable. I, I wasn't looking to sell it, but if you're gonna do something nice with it, I'll sell it. Well, I'll tell you, I'll trade you some USD for the title. <laughs> All right, I guess <laughs> that worked. Yeah. That worked? Yeah. Sweet, thanks. We'll get this on, to, get this back to the shop and start working on it. All right. <laughs> I hope it makes a good trailer. Gotta love a straight axle. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Got ourselves a square body. Yeah, we did. Look at that. A little toasty in there, huh? Good. That is a beautiful truck. Oh, Mark? Yeah. Here's the new battery. Okay. You awesome. know, it kind of sucks that Chad wanted his battery, but you know what? To make a deal happen, I'm okay with giving back his battery. You can't blame the guy. He got half his money back, you know? <laughs> So the Duralast Gold battery has maximum cold cranking amps and reserve capacity ratings to meet or exceed your vehicle's original specifications. It's got the maximum number of plates and grids to deliver the most during startup. And it comes with a nationwide three-year free replacement warranty. It's a project. Put it on the lift. Well, we finally got our square body in our hands. It took a lot of effort, 
searching, digging through the internet and people we know, but we found the perfect example for us to start building. You know what this thing looks like? What? Looks like Scott's truck. <laughs> or Dale, I don't know. Are we gonna tell them what we're doing or what? I say no. No hints? Look, surprise. Okay. Let's just say it's gonna be a period correct build. Yeah. I'm gonna deliver this to Scott. He'll appreciate this. I'm gonna go to the lake. Oh yeah, that sounds good. Can't wait to build we this We probably truck, should man. order parts. We should do that. Coming up next, we take a closer look at our new K10 square body project to see if it's as clean as we thought it was. Then I dive into a nice front brake upgrade. Later, we give this old square body some much needed new parts that we got from Rock Auto. And then we put it to the test at Woolies Off-Road Park. This ought to be fun. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Brandon Burke. And I'm Mark Christ, and we've got ourselves a square body Chevy. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Oh yeah, and I think the first thing we need to do to this truck is put it up in the air, figure out why the uh, torque converter is rattling. Yeah, it's like a one-man band under there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like a janitor walking down the hallway. Dude, wow. This is almost like the Suburban, but way nicer. Well, it wasn't garage kept. Right. But I mean, it's got oil leaks, you know, and you can see all the way down, but I mean, there's still chalk marks on the frame rail. Oh, I mean, yeah. look at the rockers, dude. Oh yeah, this, look at this is like solid. I don't think I've seen an inner rocker on a square body like that. No, not Ever. that nice. So the exhaust has been swapped out. Yeah. Looks like that's about the only thing touched on the bottom side. That's a nice truck. It's actually nicer now that we're underneath than it looked up top. Let's see if we can uh, figure out what that noise is. Yeah, I'm gonna guess it's somewhere in this area. It's rattling pretty hard, so. What's the issue here? Well, there's the problem. The uh, flex plate is not connected to the torque converter. Let's try to tighten it up. Yeah. That's the other problem. Flex plate to crank bolts. You know what that means, right? Yeah, either the engine or the transmission have to come out. Well, there's, there's pretty much our day. That's the rest of our day. I say the transmission comes out. Good idea. All right. First thing first is this rear drive shaft. Oh yeah, that looks pretty good. It really is. Perfect, drop okay. her down. Look at that. Transmission cooler lines disconnected. Think it'll ride like that. Get out of here. Look at that. Oh. There's a reason why flex plates have uh, torque specs, Brandon. Those are not supposed to be hand tight. I mean, look at that. Every single one of them. Well, the flex plate's trash. So we're gonna take this one off and go grab a new one. All right, so here's the problem with a flex plate when you don't get the bolts completely tight. Now, some of these holes are actually oblong from the factory, but when you leave the bolts loose, it starts to rattle in there and then it oblongs the holes even more. Uh, and actually on a couple of these, you can see where the threads of the bolt started to bang against the flex plate and uh, wall the holes out a little more than they should be. Um, that's really hard on these things and not to mention uh, pretty dangerous. So uh, we got a new flex plate. We're gonna go ahead and get this thing installed, get the transmission back in and uh, move on to the next thing. Oh, look at that, like a glove. We'll get the flex plate bolted on and torque it to factory spec, being sure to use the proper torque sequence. Now the transmission can be reinstalled, and of course, 
We're making sure the bolts are tight this time. With the trans in place, the cross member can be bolted back in. Now it's time for the transfer case, and once that's tight, we'll hook up the linkages and reinstall the drive shafts. Oh! No more knock! Yeah! This thing purrs like a kitten! Got a brutal exhaust leak, though. Yeah. Couldn't even hear that before. <laughs> awesome. Well, well what do you think? One problem down. Well, what do you think? Uh, finish ordering parts and get this thing back on the road? Yeah, let's um, let's do some tune-up stuff and change the fluids and, you know, get it back up and running and go out and have some fun with it. Let's do it. I give this 85 K10 a much needed brake job and inspect the hubs and make sure they're good to go. Now we still got a handful of things left to do to our square body before we put it back on the road. And one of those things is gonna be the front brakes. Now these older four wheel drive trucks, they got a little bit different rotors than uh, say a newer car where the rotor would just slip off once you get the caliper off. These ones you actually have to disassemble the entire hub, which is what I'm gonna show you guys right now. These rotors actually don't come off like the way they usually do, something like this. And then uh, you actually have to take these hubs apart from the inside. First thing to do on these old four drive axles is get the caliper loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna need to replace those brake lines. Look at that. Now we're gonna start attacking the uh, lockout hub. This is your axle engagement. Free lock. These hubs are pretty easy to take apart. As long as you got a few specialty tools. All right, let me take the hub, pull the lock out, out. Take your snap ring. Snap ring off the axle shaft. Take one of your bolts from the lockout. Voila, you see that? So that's the axle shaft that's spinning from the differential. And this is your hub, and they are not interlocked at all. And that is what your lockout does. Takes the hub and locks it to the axle. It's actually pretty cool. Let's see. There we go. Perfection. We got all of our brake parts from Rock Auto, including new wheel studs to put the new rotors on. We got new caliper bolts, banjo bolts and washers. And of course, we're gonna be replacing those decrepit brake lines that are on our truck. And uh, we ended up opting for some hub seals. That way we keep our old bearings in nice condition, keep all the dirt and the water out of them because they're actually in really good condition. But as far as brakes go, we went with power stops, drilled and slotted rotors. That's gonna give us a little bit more braking power, especially since these have 31s, which are a little bit bigger than stock, but it's always a good idea to have better braking power. And as far as pads go, they have pretty much every option, everything from your normal ceramics all the way up to your carbon fiber ceramics. And we're gonna be going with the carbon fiber ones because why not? Um, but before we put on the brakes, we gotta actually remove the old hub off the old rotor. Now there's a few ways you can knock these studs out. One, you can use like an arbor press or a shop press, um, an air hammer. I'm just gonna use a big hammer. Whoop. Look at all the grooves in it. See all that pitting? I mean, they'd work, but they'd make a lot of racket. Well, before we flip this hub over, I need to remove the outer bearing so we don't lose anything. That's passenger. 
Set that right there. Now I highly recommend installing new studs. This is one of those jobs where I will use an air hammer. Just like that. Look at that. This thing will be fresh for years. There we go. We're gonna actually be installing new lockouts. It's just cheap insurance that our four wheel drive will actually work when we go use this thing. Look at that. Old, new. And these just line up with the holes. Beautiful. Once again, we're gonna be using Power Stops Extreme uh, carbon fiber ceramic pads. This should give us plenty of stopping power. Now we're gonna be replacing this old decrepit brake line. Well, now that we got our new hoses on, rotors, studs, lockouts, pads, front's done. All we gotta do is bleed the brakes, but before we bleed the brakes, I'm gonna replace the rear line too. Up next, we replace the old parts with some new parts that we got from Rock Auto. Tom, it's nice to have you in the shop again. This is the uh, truck we're working on. It's an 85 Chevy K10. Look, looks clean. It's very clean, almost completely rust free. And that's kind of why we're getting it back on the road again before we tear it apart and build it the way we want to. And uh, already got the brakes on there. There's new studs, pads, uh, new brake hoses. So this thing should stop better than it did before. Yeah, stay cooler if you're towing or have exactly. the giant tires on there. Yep. You know, it's got some oil leaks and it needs a tune up, but <laughs> a it's, it's a clean truck. So if you want to go underneath, uh, I'll show you around. Now I'm not gonna lie, it's greasy under here, <laughs> but it's clean, no rust. What actually took the truck off the road was the flex plate came loose from the crank and the torque converter and uh, was making a bunch of noise, ruined the flex plate. Anyways, truck's all fixed, there's no more noises, so really the only thing left is tune up and get this thing back on the road and, and drive it around. Uh, speaking of getting it back on the road, I think Mark's got parts laid out over there if you want to check them out. Let's do it. Well, Tom, what'd you think of the truck? It looked really nice. And shiny new brakes on there and yeah. a lot of potential. Yeah, so we got the brakes from you guys and then obviously the rest of the stuff here on the table, this is the kind of stuff you want to use when you're doing that. Tune-up items, belts, hoses, you know, changing the fluids and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, we're replacing the spark plug wires that you can get rid of a lot of problems you didn't even know you had, little hesitation problems, hard, hard to track down, little gremlins. So. And especially when you can buy it at the price point that you guys sell it for, it just makes sense to just do it all uh, because like you can get name brand, like for instance, we got AC Delco hoses and belts, spark plugs, we got Felpro gaskets, Wix filters, all at a price that is equivalent to no name brand at a box store would be. Yeah, before the family started Rock Auto, it used to frustrate me that the classic car markups, you, you'd go in the store and say, oh, that's a classic car, so the shock is over, costs three times as much, and we don't do any of that at Rock Auto. When I was on your website looking for parts for this truck, there's a really big catalog of parts that you guys carry for, even though it's you know nearly 40 years old. Right, yeah, you don't have to hoard the fuel filters. <laughs> Every time you come across one, it's like, you can buy one anytime, day or night. Yeah, exactly, you know, and that's nice too. But uh, you know, we just wanna get the truck up and up in, in tip top shape, and I feel like the parts that we have here are gonna do it. So I um, actually need to get busy. All right, I'll, I'll leave you to it. Getting some grease under my fingernails, <laughs> so I'll show you out. Cool. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, yeah, it was fun to see the new truck. All right, well, I'm going to get busy attacking these maintenance items, and I'm going to start here underneath the truck. The first thing I'm going to do is drain this front diff. The trick is figuring out how to do this without getting it all over you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's gross. You can see the sludge coming out. It goes on like this. It's very tempting to apply too much silicone.
go ahead and pull this air cleaner off and I can start working on that tuna. Usually those just fall right off. When I'm replacing plugs and wires, I like to leave the wires where they are and then install the new wires on the bench. Original coil. But if it ain't broke, I'm gonna find the longest one. Put the longest one on number one. Perfect. This one's a trim to fit. Put it in place. Looks like it has to be trimmed on this end. Make a nice clean cut. Test fit. Looks pretty good. It's a test fit. Side by side. That needs to go. Fill some fluids. This thing will be ready to hit the road. It's nice and clean. Time for the gasket. Fill this up. Coming up, we head to Woolies Off-Road and put this 85K10 through the mud. <laughs> I love this truck. Well, we got our square body all dialed in, at least to our liking. Yeah. For what we want to do with it. And uh, we're getting ready to take it out and have some fun with it. But before we do that, we want to give this thing a bath. Well, now that we got the whole truck all wet, we went to Sonex for their line of auto detailing products. They have everything you need from basic car wash soaps, tire and wheel cleaners, even fallout remover. First things first, we got to attack this brake dust on these wheels. I'm going to start with this multi-star cleaner on the tires just to kind of pull some of that dirt stain out of the rubber. Cleans it off the white letters too. Watch this hood. This. It's gonna be a crazy transformation. That is a cool patina look. I'd rock it. Dude, this thing runs good. I know. It's not like mint condition, but it's pretty nice. This is a driver. We're here at Woolies Off-Road, our favorite off-road park. And it's time to test this truck out. You know, uh, I'm really glad that we decided to just do a few things to this truck, bring it out to see what it'll do because I have a feeling this is gonna be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, it's, it's a nice truck too. We gotta, we gotta be gentle. We gotta be gentle. Let's do it. Well, this thing's got stock suspension on it. Yep. It's got 31s on it. Stock everything except the 31 1050s. Mm -hmm. To me, this is perfect because this was a farm truck. Yeah. It's whole life. And this is the kind of stuff it did. Yeah, I noticed when I pulled the front uh, diff cover off how the gears were not worn out, but worn in, you know? Yeah. I'm blown away with how solid this truck is. Like the yeah. fact that it only needs cab corners is not an exaggeration. Like when you're talking about a classic truck or what's timeless. Oh yeah. First gen Dodge. Square body Chevy. Yep. Dense side Ford. Yep. Like, there's a reason why. And it's not because they're they're particularly better built, but it was just the intensive purposes of what the vehicle was gonna be used for. You know, they did take design into account. Oh, for sure. Like I mean, look at the truck. This has gotta be the most iconic. At least for GM, the most iconic design ever. Every music video, oh, every, yeah, every TV country, show, every country song, square body Chevy. Yeah. This is like the, just call it the fishbowl. Oh, this I whole see. pond. Yeah, it's like a little circle and here. Drive in circles, get get the back end a little. It's like a little cul-de-sac. Mm-hmm. You know. Get it, get it, get it, get it.
close. <laughs> it's always fun playing in the mud. This is awesome. Get a little mud rut right, right there on your lens. I mean, the only thing that's happened so far is we lost a beauty ring. <laughs> I love this truck. That's what this truck was built for. Hey, Mark. What? I know what we need to do to the truck now. You're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Go ahead. You ready for it? I'm ready. A Fall Guy knockoff. I knew it. Long bed, square body Chevy, two-tone. Put a roll bar in it. Stunt capable. Yes. I mean, what else are you gonna do with this truck besides what we just did? Nothing else would do this truck any service. Catch bad guys. Let's do it. All right, let's go back to the shop. Yep. Order parts and build ourselves a knockoff Fall Guy truck. I love it. Are we still gonna keep it this color? I, I want to. Sweet. I think this is gonna be a fun project. What do you think we should call it? Oh, I got it, I got it. Stunt double. No, Faux Guy. Oh, like Faux Guy, not like Fall fake. Guy. <laughs> let's do it. I love it. Coming up next, we dig into our plans for this K10 square body project. Then we talk about what will power our K10 Chevy and dive into the TCI 4L80E powertrain. Later, we get separation anxiety and start tearing this square body down. And then I repair the cab corners on our K10 square body. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Brandon Burke. And I'm Mark Christ, and we're back on our square body Chevy. We've got ourselves a square body Chevy project. That's exciting. Today's the day where we're gonna dig in deep on this project and start turning some nuts and bolts. Now, the last time y'all saw this 86 K10, we took it out, we had some fun, and then we decided what this truck's second life is gonna look like. Well, that's gonna be a tribute to the 80s TV show, The Fall Guy, which we're calling the faux guy. Now this truck's actually in really good shape. There's almost no rust between that and all the original paperwork in the glove box with the owner's manual. Me and Mark decided that we're gonna keep this color scheme, this dark navy blue and silver, which I think is a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I love that color scheme. Uh, the moment I saw it, I was like, yes. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's gonna save us some time with the door jams and the engine bay, mm -hmm. and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. So this truck is not a clone, it is a tribute. So there's things about it that the TV truck had that our truck won't have. Obviously it's a Chevy, not a GMC. It's not gonna have that crazy hideaway box in the bed, that's okay. But there are some components that you have to have to make Colt Seavers proud. Of course, got some restoration components to bring this truck back to its original glory. And then we're gonna tap into the aftermarket for some performance parts to bring this truck up to the level that we think it deserves and quite frankly, build the truck that we want to build. Yeah, now there's a lot of parts that we're going to be throwing under our square body to make it our faux guy truck. We're going to start up here at the front. Old school guys probably recognize this. This is Warren's M8274 winch. This is probably Warren's most recognized winch. It was introduced in 1974, so it's been going on for almost 50 years now, which is pretty crazy. And you might be wondering what all those letters and numbers actually mean. M just stands for model pretty self-explanatory. H stands for 8,000 pound capacity, which this winch has now been upgraded to a 10,000 pound capacity, which is really nice. Two just stands for two-way, so free spool and power in, which pretty much every model has nowadays. And then 74 just stands for the year it was introduced, 1974. Now there's two models of this nowadays, and we have the S model, which means synthetic. So it comes with the rope, 
and it comes with the fair lead without the cable rollers on it. And the nice thing about a synthetic winch is it's a little bit lighter and it's a little bit safer. And I don't think there's any 4x4 build that's retro that's complete without an 8274. Moving on to the restoration components, you can see we've got this awesome grill setup that we got from Classic Industries. It comes with the grill, the bow tie logo, and the bezels for the headlights. We went ahead and also got the headlights, turn signals, some side markers, and some fender badges. Now these are just little pieces, but a little bit goes a long way on stuff like this. Uh, as for cooling, uh, we tapped Holly for this awesome, massive uh, frostbite radiator. It's got the dual fan setup that bolts right in. It's gonna just drop right in our truck. Yeah, then we went to Summit Racing for these sweet chrome wagon wheels. I mean, a, a retro style is not complete without the chrome wagon wheels and then a chrome roll bar to go with it. Yeah, and uh, as far as centerpieces of what we've got laid out here, these axles definitely stand out. We've got Dana 60s front and rear that we got directly from Dana Spicer. These are crate axles. These are universal crate axles. You can just buy this. This is the way it came to us, right in a crate. Uh, what's cool about this is it's got an electronic locker in here and you can actually wire that up. 410 gears, it's got a high pinion setup. Of course, the tube's completely blank, so you can adapt it to anything that you're building. Coolest part about this to me, though, is these uh, huge spindles and knuckle and brake assemblies here on the outside. Everything outside of this ball joint is super heavy duty. It's got massive dual piston brake calipers. This is actually very similar to what you find in a late model Dodge, a one-ton Dodge. It even has the, the worn lockout hubs there. And then continuing on with some more restoration parts, we went to rockauto.com and got steps and a new gas tank. That way all of our new fuel goes to our new engine nice and clean. And then of course, some more restoration components here from Classic Industries, door seals and gaskets. We've actually got all new rubber for this entire truck. And of course, we'll get to a lot of that later on in the build. Yeah, and to top it off, we're gonna match the rear axle with the front axle with another Dana 60. Same gearing, electric locker in the rear as well. And then this has got disc brakes. So not only is this truck gonna look good, it's actually gonna handle on and off road just as well. And there's another tailgate to fix our dented one. Now I noticed these big brakes back here and on the front as well. Is this hinting to some powertrain? Extra power, maybe? Let's check it out. <laughs> yeah. Next, we take a look at our nearly 600 horsepower Chevy big block and we'll go behind the scenes at TCI Automotive. Well, we've been introducing a lot of the parts that are going to be making up our square body Chevy build, but we haven't yet got into the big components of the drivetrain, specifically the powertrain, starting with the engine. So we definitely wanted to go big block, and looking back, we realized that we haven't done anything but fuel injection. So this engine is definitely gonna get carbureted to keep it simple, and you might even recognize this engine from the twins that our sister show engine power built. In case you missed it, check it out. These 496 cubic inch big block Chevys feature forged Eagle crankshaft and H-beam rods, forged Icon pistons, and Howard's hydraulic camshaft and lifters, as well as all of the other supporting components to make these big blocks sing. And everything came from Summit Racing. Short block was topped with TrickFlow Specialties power port, 320 cc heads, ARP hardware throughout, and Wyand Track Warrior single plane intake. Once everything was torqued to spec, it was time to hit the dyno. So the first time we know of, two identical big block Chevys were coupled together and then dynoed together. It did it, Woo! it did it. Oh my God. <laughs> and the pair made 1167 horsepower but individually, each one made almost 600, and we get to use one of them. Well, I don't know about you, Brandon, but 600 horsepower and a four-wheel drive square body? It's gonna that, be pretty cool. That's gonna be pretty sweet. Now, this engine is pretty much ready to rip. We actually got a brand new carburetor that no one's seen before going on here. We got a really cool belt drive and a set of headers. Yeah, and it's just gonna drop right in, mm -hmm. which is the best part. Let's move on to the transmission. Well, we definitely needed a heavy duty transmission for that big block. That's what we've got here with this 4L80E Super Street Fighter Trans that we got from TCI Automotive. It's made to handle up to 875 horsepower, so it's gonna be plenty strong for our 600 horse big block. 
Now, as for the torque converter, we went with this bolt together design, triple disc torque converter, which has a lockup in it as well. And it's got a stall of 3000 to 3200 RPM. And as for the flex plate, we went with TCI's SFI approved flex plate. Uh, now TCI has been in business for a long time and chances are they've got a transmission for your project. Well, here's who they are, what they do and how they do it. TCI Automotive was founded in 1968 as a small local business dedicated to delivering high performance transmissions and parts to a small group of hardcore drag racers. In the 50 plus years since, the company has grown to be one of the largest and most technologically advanced automatic transmission manufacturers in the world. From concept to a finished product that's headed out the door to a happy customer, TCI handles every step of the build process. In its hometown of Ashland, Mississippi, TCI has highly trained technicians and builders, its own R&D and engineering facilities, dedicated test vehicles, and multiple dynos, so every piece is tested for quality control before it ever leaves the facility. Well, being we're running the 4L ADE and it's a fully electronic transmission, you have to have a transmission controller. And since this truck was never equipped with EFI or an electronic transmission, it makes sense that we run an aftermarket transmission control unit. And that's what we've got here with this brand new Edelbrock TC. Uh, you can see it's got a nice compact design. You can mount it pretty much anywhere. Uh, this thing will allow you to control your shift points, shift firmness, shift speed, torque converter lockup, line pressure, and even your speedo calibration, among many other things. Now, there are different setups that are already in here. You can use the setup wizard, so make it nice and easy. Or you can set your own tune, and you can communicate with this thing through an app that you download to your phone, whether you have Android or Apple iOS. Now this thing will control GM 4L60, 4L65, 4L70, 4L80 transmissions. Um, and not only that, it comes with its own wiring harness here. It's nice and simple and tidy, easy plug and play. And this will work with either EFI or carbureted applications like ours. And just like everything else at Elbrock, it's made right here in the US of A. And as far as our transfer case goes, we found ours on Summit Racing. This is a new process 241C, so this would have came in 2500s and 3500s from the mid 90s to the late 90s, which is nice because it comes with a 32 count input shaft that's gonna match our transmission. And it also comes with a front yoke on the driver's side, so that's gonna match our front axle that we chose. Not only are all these components heavy duty, but they're bolt together, so they're gonna be easy to install. Now that we've got our heartbeat figured out, we're gonna start tearing into the truck, tear it apart, put it back together. Up next, Brandon and I blow this truck apart. Uh, kinda. All right, well, the body's not very rusty. But a lot of the bolts underneath are, and uh, we finally started tearing this thing apart. Yeah, we're gonna tear this thing all the way down. I don't know about all the way, but pretty far. Most. Let's do it. All right, I got it. Now the impact's nice and all, but that's kind of what its job is meant to do is to break bolts loose. And you guys know that I like my hand tools. So let's see if deep creep helps with this ratchet. Stubber. Mmm. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Not bad. Uh, especially since this truck's never been apart, and you'll probably notice we like to spray all these rusty bolts with Seafoam Deep Creep. Deep Creep is a powerful penetrating oil and lubricant. It works fast to break the metal surface tension and helps free stubborn parts from rust and corrosion. You can also use it to oil bushings, chains, gears, hinges, rollers, and slides. But around here, we love it for getting into rusty bolts and nuts, specifically, like the ones that are holding our bed on. Let's see how it works. With all the bed bolts loose, we can now remove the tailgate. Then we can remove the bed. There you go. 
This is a truck bed lifter. One of the most invaluable tools while working on truck. Ready? Yep. Hit it. Oh, you're good, right there. Send it. Coming on down. I think these bolts are tight. There it is. There you go. It's a nice hood. It's a beautiful truck. Deep creep's not just good for bolts. Put the Brandon touch on it. Mm-hmm. Every bolt is still in place, and they all just come right out. Pretty impressive. Well, the impressive part is none of these trucks still oh, have their I don't think I've ever taken one of those off. Fell right off now. Oh. Wow. Besides being dirty, this is the cleanest square body I've seen. Pull these headlight bezels off. Yeah. Are you ready? After that big old mess. Moving up front, with the hood out of the way, we can start removing the front clip. Thumbs like holding up. Oh, wire? What that wire? One wire. One wire. One Four. wire. Get you a pair. There's always something you forget. Cutters. Always something you forget. Uh, let's see. One little wire. Just like, one little. It's a big gauge wire. Oh, uh, it's like a power wire. Let's try it. Can you send it? There it is. We're free now. You ready? Yep. There we go. Yay! If we would have took the AC line off. Well, I cut it. I just cut it in the wrong side. <laughs> Dude. Wow. Getting there. Everywhere we look, this truck's clean. Nice truck. Yeah. Keep digging. I'm gonna pull the interior out. Yeah. Coming up, say goodbye to the only rust this Chevy truck's ever seen. Looks good now. Now, before we completely disassemble our square body project, I want to address the soft cab corners here on the back of the cab while the door's still on. That way, we can get the door gaps and the uh, rocker panel gap lined up. Now. With that being said, this is a clean truck. I mean, you can see the chassis really clean. All the other body panels are super clean, um, but the back of the cab is pretty soft. Now we went to Classic Industries for some of the restoration components, but they also have sheet metal, and this is where we got these panels from. Now we're probably not gonna use the entire panel, hopefully, uh, but before we cut this up and uh, start taking measurements, we need to get the paint off the back of the cab and see how far that rust goes. <laughs> Well, that cab corner's in really nice shape. The rust doesn't go past the rocker seam. It's literally just this bottom. So that's probably where we're gonna start cutting that sheet metal off. So this is a really good example of why you don't just patch this spot right here is because on the background, all the way into the middle of the seam, it's rusting away. So a little patch panel would have worked for a couple of years, but cab corner is still rusting away. Now you're getting it cleaned up. Like I said, chisel works just fine. This, that's actually part of the outer rocker right there. So we gotta figure out how we're gonna repair that. Woo. This is like one of those things where multiple tools are necessary to get this panel 
to look like it was never replaced. I'm gonna call that pretty dang good. Well, we got lucky on our square body. We didn't have to cut too much out of the cab corner, but if your truck's from the north, it's probably got a bunch of rust. And this cab corner from Classic Industries goes pretty much a third of the way up the back of the cab. So you got plenty of meat on the bone to uh, replace all that rotted sheet metal, but uh, we don't need it. So we're just gonna cut this one low. Ooh, that's pretty close now. That's the one nice thing about Classic Industry panels is that they're 18 gauge, so it's gonna match the sheet metal that would've came factory on this truck. That way it's gonna be nice to weld to both of these panels, but it's also gonna be just as strong as the factory. And as you could tell, it comes E-coated with the rust prevention. But since we're about to do body work and strip this truck, I wanna go ahead before I install this panel and strip just the outside. I'm gonna leave the inside so it's got the rust prevention, but I'm gonna strip the outside. That way, when I'm done, this thing's gonna be ready for body work. Now, like I said, I wanna keep the E-coat on the inside, that way it keeps our rust prevention and that cab corner doesn't rust out again. But this is ready to go in and get welded up and ready for body work. Spot welder time. Oh, yes. Grind this down smooth, and you'll never know I did it. One thing to remember when you're grinding welds on sheet metal is to always grind with the weld, not against it, because the weld's harder than the sheet metal. So if you go this way, you're actually just gonna take the sheet metal away instead of the actual weld. Brando, whoa, look at that cab corner. Never in my life have I seen one that nice. Well, I, <laughs> I feel like there's some sarcasm in there. It looks good though, seriously. But thanks. What's next? Um, I still got the other cab corner, but I'll be honest, I ain't doing it this week. I think I'm gonna go to the river. Camping? Oh yeah. Pavilion? Yeah, it's family friendly too. Coming up, teardown begins on our 85 square body. Mark hands me the cab and the chassis is stripped down. We rip out the old drivetrain and start mocking up the new. Our suspension needs some attention and modification begins on our new axle. And finally, Mark puts it all back together. Not gonna lie, this is gonna be one cool ride. most iconic design. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Brandon Burke. And I'm Mark Christ. And as you can see, we've got our square body Chevy in here. We've been plugging away on it. Uh, we're very excited about this project. In fact, last time, uh, Brandon repaired the cab corners. They look really good. Thankfully, that was really the only rust yeah. on the whole truck. And um, we also got the truck torn down a bit, but we want to tear it down even more. And that's what I'm going to work on today. I'm going to go ahead and start on the bed and uh, do the body work. So I'll do the dusty stuff. If you do the greasy stuff, I'm all about that. Uh, so I want to get the cab off of here next so I can get it over to Brandon. In fact, we're going to check on him a little bit later. Uh, but before I do that, I want to take as much stuff off of this cab as I can, because it's a lot easier to do that now while it's bolted to the chassis. So that's what I'm going to do first. It's hard to do this without this special tool, I'll tell you that. There we go. Sweet. Survived. Okay, finally. Well, that's what I missed. There's a groove right there that the wheels pop out of. I'll know that when I put it back in. Uh, 
That's never been out of there before. Right, here we go. Ooh. That was a beast. Get the seat out of here. Oh, look at this. A little treasure trove. What's this? A bill of sale. $2,500. We overpaid for this truck. All right, I'm gonna remove the speaker, original speakers, seat belts, and the four wheel drive shifter bezel so I can get all this floor covering out of the way. There we go. With all of that stuff out of the way, this old dingy, smelly floor mat can be removed. That's disgusting. Looks good. Pretty good. Well, I guarantee it won't go back on as easily as it came off. That's all right. Well, we only had one body cart, so we ordered another one from Summit Racing. So that's what I'm gonna put the cab on here is this brand new body cart. See how this works out. Body's off. I'm gonna get this thing out to Brandon so he can start prepping it for paint. I'm gonna tear that chassis down. Hey Brandon. Yeah. I brought you something. I got it mostly stripped down for you. There's a couple things left. I don't know what you want to do with the firewall and if you need a hand maybe taking out that glass. I can yeah, already. I already got this bedside done. Look at that. That looks straight. Yeah, that looks great. Guess what? What? Zero filler. Wow. This well, is a maybe, straight truck. I was gonna say, maybe you can keep that up. Mm -hmm. I got more tear down to do. Good luck. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Better you than me. Up next, the drivetrain is removed and tear down is underway. It's always easier to keep as much bolted together as possible. Now this is the part of the truck that I really love. Since Brandon's gonna be working on the body, I'm gonna tackle this. Now I know it doesn't look like much, and that may be in part because of all the mud that's covering it because we took it to Woolies. <laughs> it's always fun playing in the mud. <laughs> I love this truck. Other than all of that silt, sand, dirt, and mud caked on this thing, this is actually a very impressive half ton four wheel drive truck chassis. Let's start here with the power plant. This is a small block Chevy. Don't get too excited, it's not a 350. This is the 305, and I know that sounds terrible because what do we do with 305s? We make boat anchors out of them, but at 160 horsepower and 235 pound-feet of torque, this thing would get the job done for anybody that had a completely stock half-ton Chevy back in the mid-80s. But where the shining star is on this chassis is the transmission. It's the 700R4, which was really ahead of its time. This is the first automatic transmission in a half-ton Chevy that had an overdrive at a 0.70 to one, but it also had a 3.06 to one first gear, which compensated for that small horsepower output of the engine. Behind that transmission is a 208 chain-driven transfer case, two-speed, which on its own right is actually a really good transfer case, although it's not really what you're gonna use to do any rock climbing or anything like that. Axles, this thing's got 10 bolts in the front and rear. Again, half-ton truck, nothing wrong with those, but that's not gonna be good enough for us. Now it does have leaf springs in the front and rear, which we are going to retain. Other than that, this truck is gonna change completely. As a matter of fact, the only thing that we're retaining from what you see here is the frame itself, which leads me to what I'm gonna do next. Well, I've got everything sprayed down with some sea foam deep creep. Now all I need to do is start loosening some bolts, tearing this thing down. We're gonna concentrate on getting the drivetrain removed, starting with the drive shafts.
Well, this is the part where I would normally pull the exhaust out of here, but it's welded up solid front to back and uh, I don't feel like fighting it. I think we're just gonna go ahead and go down and pull the engine transmission transfer case out of here. We'll get the exhaust later. With the carb out of the way, we can bolt on our lift plate. Now it's time to pull the engine, and since there's not a body on here, I can just pluck the engine, transmission, and transfer case all out at once. benefit of having an overhead crane, which allows me to do this job by myself, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. Anytime you got this much weight hanging, things can go wrong real fast. So it's a good idea to not get in between the load and say the floor. You may notice I put a rubber glove on the tail housing of the transfer case, so I don't make a huge mess with transmission fluid spilling everywhere. It's always easier to Keep as much bolted together as possible because, well, just less work. Oh boy, it's a little heavy. Well, at least that wasn't transmission fluid. Once the engine's out, it's time to move on to the axles and suspension. Since I already sprayed these bolts with deep creep, they should all come out pretty easily. So far so good until we get to the leaf spring bolts that are seized inside the bushing sleeves, which require a little more use of the impact. Well, we've just about got this thing torn down to the bare chassis. There's a few things on here I need to remove, but for now I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about though is these half ton axles are gone out of the way. And before you know it, we're gonna have some one tons under this thing with a six inch lift. Can't wait. Next, Mark cuts, grinds, our new front axle. All right, well, we're plugging away on our K10 square body here. I went ahead and got the frame stripped down a little bit more, took the fuel tank, fuel lines, and brake lines off. Did leave the steering box on here because we're gonna start mocking up our axles and steering. Uh, starting up front here, you can see we've got our Dana 60 crate axle already in place. It's pretty much where it's gonna be. It might need to move a little bit once we start installing the suspension, but uh, we introduced that a while back. It's just exciting to see it now where it's getting ready to be mated with the truck. Now to connect those two, we went to Skyjacker for everything that you see here on the floor. Now this is a direct bolt-in kit. This kit comes with the soft ride springs that Skyjacker makes, as well as the U-bolts, nuts, longer brake hoses, shocks, all of that for both the rear and the front that we're gonna have to switch up a little bit on a couple of components. And that's with what you see here. Basically, uh, just a couple of things, spring perches, larger U-bolts and retaining plates all to adapt that half ton suspension lift kit to our one ton axles. We got all of this stuff from Summit Racing. We'll start by installing our front leaf springs. Do some measuring. Then we can measure to get our axles centered left to right. This is where the difficult part is gonna come in. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The, where this leaf spring falls, because this frame is so narrow on this truck, uh, with the cast iron part of our center section here, we can't just attach it to the tube. So we gotta figure out how to attach that properly where it's gonna be nice and sturdy and flat and straight, and we can run U-bolts on both sides there. All right, so here's the solution. Uh, this is gonna be the perch. This is the right radius for our three and a half inch tube on our axle. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set that down on the axle and then I'm just gonna cut this part so it fits over the cast iron part of the center section. Then for the U-bolts, well, this 
is a three and a half inch diameter U-bolt that's gonna fit over the smooth part of the axle. And then I got this, I found this on Summit Racing. Uh, this is a little over four inch diameter here. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna go and cradle the cast iron part. All right, I'm just gonna make some marks here uh, where I wanna grind to. All right, well, I've got that opened up on the inside. It's got some room to move around. I wanna throw this level on here to see how close it is. It's close, I don't wanna to go too much though. Get the weight of the, the leaf on there and start fitting that U-bolt. Call that good. Now we've got this little plate. Jeremy down a carcass made. It's got offset holes for these two different size U-bolts. Then the passenger side, and it just clamps to the axle tube. All right, well, I mentioned before I was gonna leave the steering box in place, but we decided we're gonna go ahead and upgrade to this PSC box, which is actually really super nice. Um, some of the features on this box is it's got a really heavy duty PSC cast case. Um, it's got billet covers and end caps. Uh, and then another cool feature about this is it's got these dash six ports in case you want to do hydro assist later or if you're planning your build to have hydro assist right off the bat, this is the steering box for you. And with the new. Well, this is more of a sweeping style for crossover steering. So that's what we're gonna be installing on this truck. Uh, it's actually got the arm right here on the crate axle with the boss for the crossover uh, drag link to attach there. And of course, we've got the bosses for the tie rods. Now, all we need to do is connect the dots and we're gonna do that with the stuff that you see here on the floor that we got from Steer Smarts. Now, they make super heavy duty stuff for late model Jeeps and other late model vehicles as well. This stuff is actually for a late model Jeep with the Crate Dana 60 axle. It's really the closest stuff that's on the market to what we're doing to this truck here. But for now, I wanna go ahead and get that tie rod on, then we'll move on to the drag link. Side attached first. That just looks cool. This is a three and a half inch drop. It's the one I had, so that's what we're starting with. Then we attach the pitman arm to the steering box so we can install the drag link. Just mock up. By the way, this is called Steer Smart's Yeti XD system in case you're looking for it for your Jeep or whatever. And it looks like the length is pretty close, but the leaf's kind of in the way. Even if I hold it on top, which it has to go underneath because of the taper, even if I hold it on top, it's still touching the leaf. So I really need to come up higher here. I really need to space this up. So I need to figure out a different end for this to attach to the top, maybe with some spacers, a spherical end or something like that. And that would, that would solve that problem. Steer Smarts is working on a solution for us up front. So we're moving on to the rear. Just like the front, we'll get the leafs installed and bolt them in. All right. Axles are in. Coming up, we put it all back together. Get this torque converter installed in the trans. Our mock-up phase is complete. All right, well, we're plugging away on mock-up on our square body Chevy here. Uh, we do have a little bit left as far as the axles and suspension goes, and that is the steering linkage. Uh, I do have some parts ordered for that, so I'll address that later. For now, I wanna go ahead and get the engine, transmission, transfer case all bolted together, drop that in, get that mocked up. Then we'll be ready to just tear this all down, send the frame off to get blasted and painted. So first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and get this flex plate installed. All right, this ARP fastener assembly lube is supposed to go under the head. That way you get it torqued properly. Now thread locker on the threads. Blue. You know, for being somebody that's left-handed, you'd think I could start these bolts a little easier. 
85. Let's get this torque converter installed in the trans. Just wanna make sure this little O-ring right here is lubed up as it should be. Ooh, that sounded like it. You don't get them in there all the way and you bolt it up, it'll trash your pump. Ah, that was it right there. These ARPs are like the perfect solution. To adapt our transmission to our transfer case, we got this OEM style adapter off the internet since they're not available in the aftermarket. The transfer case gets installed like a glove. Went ahead and separated all of this because I'm working by myself today and it'll be a little easier. Now I know it's all gonna fit together. I just need to get it in here. Because this drivetrain is longer than the original, we're gonna have to move the transmission cross member back, which is gonna require us to drill new holes in the frame. Six, seven degrees. I'm okay with that. My dad always told me, always, always, always center punch before you drill. So your drill bit don't walk on you. And always drill a pilot hole. Let the drill do the work. There I go. Well, something else I wanna go ahead and fit right now are the headers. I uh, went ahead and got the driver's side installed. It fits really well. We got these from Hooker. Uh, these are specifically made for a big block Chevy in a K10 square body like this. So they should fit. Like it. Well, we've got our steering problem solved. Uh, Steer Smarts went ahead and sent me a new end here. So this is the one that comes with the kit. And then this is the one they sent. So all things being equal, basically what it does is it flips the ball joint rather than facing up, it faces it, faces it down. And it actually comes with this little uh, sleeve that goes in the taper. So it's a top mount kit, they call it. So this goes in the taper. Oh yeah, that's gonna work. And I'll have that adjusted where it'll be upright like that. Oh, I love it, that's a good solution. Well, really all that's left as far as the mock-up phase goes uh, is gonna be my shocks and steering stabilizers and i um, not gonna bore you with all that. I feel like we accomplished a lot today. Uh, and the next time you see this thing, well, the frame is gonna go out, get all cleaned up and painted and it's gonna be just as shiny and pretty as the rest of this stuff. I can't wait. Coming up next, the transformation begins on our 85 Chevy Square Body. We strip the body down to bare metal and give you some tips and tricks along the way. We throw down some color and put a bow on this K10 Square Body. This has got to be the most iconic design ever. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Brandon Burke, and on this episode, we're going to be diving into the body and paint on our square body Chevy project. First thing we need to do is get rid of all this dirt from when we took it out to Woolies.
Well, Mark's getting the chassis all built up and all those new parts hung. I've been working on the bodywork. I've already got the passenger side done. Now it's time to work on the driver's side. And normally we take everything to the blaster, but there's more than one way to strip paint off a vehicle. One is your tried and true aircraft paint remover. And the only really downside to this is it's messy. Um, then you got your angle grinder with a wire wheel. This one actually works really well. It's just gonna give you a nice forearm workout and uh, you might get a little acupuncture when these wires let go. So wear your safety glasses. My favorite is probably gonna be the Mud Hog. This is an eight inch pad. This is like a big DA. It takes a lot of material off really quickly without damaging your metal. And then probably something everyone's familiar with is gonna be your normal uh, six inch DA. You can use 80, 180. This is mostly for not stripping paint, but just getting the top coat ready for primer, getting all your imperfections out of there. Um, normally you don't strip a whole car with a DA. But let's start with the aircraft stripper and get some paint off. Ooh, yeah. It's been a long time since I used this stuff. Usually, it takes about 15 minutes to take the paint off. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Let's move on to the angle grinder with the wire wheel. Wire wheel works pretty good. Mud hog time. <laughs> that is why the mud hog is my favorite option. It takes a lot of material off really quick and it gives you that nice 36 grit tooth for that epoxy to stick to. Last but not least, six inch DA. Now the one thing with the DA is you really don't want to try to take pinstripes off because it'll gum up your sandpaper. So what you need to do is get you a rubber eraser wheel. Get that pinstripe off where you can sand the paint underneath. So that's four ways you can strip paint off of a vehicle if you're at your house or a collision shop. Most of the time they're gonna use one of these four ways. Paint remover, the paint stripper works really well, but there is still a mess and you still have to sand it to get the primer to stick. Wire wheel works excellent, takes all the material off, but it's pretty smooth, so you still have to abrade it. The 36 grit on a mud hog is, again, my personal favorite, because you got the nice deep scratches and all the material's gone, so this is pretty much ready for primer. And then you got your DA, which is most of the time what a collision shop's gonna use, the feather edge, all those imperfections out, and then get it ready for a top coat. Well, I call that bare metal, so the only thing left to do now is wipe it down, mask it up, and throw some primer on this thing. Up next, Brandon sprays, sands, add some filler, all to get this body ready for some color. So the primer we're using is Summit Racing's Direct to Metal Epoxy Primer. It's a one-to-one. -one. Always want to double check and make sure that the primer was mixed, even though it was on the shaker. Bodywork is probably my most favorite thing ever. It's probably hard to believe. I'll show you a little trick to get the paint or primer out of the can without making a mess. Because I'm sure anyone who's ever tried to pour paint out of one of these gallon cans 
gets it everywhere. So you take a razor blade. There. You made yourself a little funnel. We are going to the four on the one to one. And this is your catalyst. This is what's gonna activate the primer to cure up. So we're gonna go to the four on this one. Mmm, tasty. going to be thrown on top of our epoxy is Evercoat Super Build. This is a really nice primer to get a panel straight and level. It's a polyester primer and actually this one's got the guide coat built into it so it sprays pink and sands gray which is kind of cool and we also got this from Summit Racing. This stuff pours four to one. This primer is actually recommended to spray through a, at least a 2.0 tip. You could spray this through a 2.5 millimeter tip. Just depends on how, how much material you want on the panel. Time to start blocking down our super build and you might notice one thing, it's not pink anymore. And that's because I spent a couple days getting everything else in super build. So the pink kind of flashed off. So I'm just gonna have to sand it like normal primer with some guide coat. The whole reason you put guide coat down is to find your highs and lows to get rid of all the orange peel. So once the orange peel is gone, you're ready to do either body work or reprime or whatever your next step is. So we started this process with 36 grit on a mud hog. Now that the primer's on there, we're gonna go to 80 and that's gonna shape our panel. And the key is to get the biggest block on the panel that you can get. That way you get the flattest surface as possible. And you can try to get the panel flat first before you cut down your edges. Right here, this dark spot. This is actually the epoxy primer coming through. So we're gonna stop there because I don't wanna burn all the way through this high build. Um, so this spot actually is a little too low. You might not be able to see this on camera yet, but this is why super build is so great. There's 36 grit flat marks from where I took the bed liner off. See all those low spots, low, 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 like all the way through here, flat spots here. This super build is literally gonna fill in all those and then we're just gonna shape that panel back in. We lucked out on this truck because it was a really straight truck. So far, zero body filler. Well, the whole bed's in 80, We've got the high spot down and all we got left are some low spots here and here and a little bit on the bed sides. And we're gonna be fixing those with some Evercoat Rage Gold and Evercoat Metal Glaze Putty that you can find on Summit Racing. So uh, let's, get, let's get these low spots to uh, not be low anymore. Again, this is not gonna need much. It's pretty close. One thing about body filler is you really wanna start sanding it or shaping it before it hardens all the way up. Don't be going to lunch after spreading body filler. 
coming back and trying to sand it when it's a rock. This is an extremely thin layer. It's pretty good. 80 grit's done. Pretty sure all the body work's done. So let's hit it with 180 and see how straight it is. X pattern always. I can't say this enough about this truck. The straightest square body I've seen in a long time. Maybe ever. Well, I'm gonna get the rest of this body in 180 and then I'm gonna show you guys how to make sure all the panels are straight before you lay your next round of primer. Coming up, Brandon sprays the final coat of primer. Then, an in-depth look into final sanding. That's gonna be interesting. That's smooth. Now that the panel's all blocked down, we're gonna be checking for straightness. We're gonna be using just some wax and grease remover and some rags. That way we can find any high, lows, or even some waves in the panel if we didn't block it correctly. <laughs> I can see the camera guy. Hey, Greg. Underwear. Last round of primer. We're going back with another Evercoat product. This is Evercoat's Feather Fill that we also found on Summit Racing. This is another polyester primer, but it's gonna be a lot thinner than the Super Build. And we got this one in buff because I like yellow. 32 ounces. You guys won't believe what the next step is. More sanding. This step is 320 grit. This is gonna be for smoothing out all the orange peel. Not too much shaping going on. I might be the only one in the world who truly loves sanding. This is orange peel. This is what you're trying to get rid of. This is what make, gonna make your paint look rough. Now that we've got all the orange peel cut down with 320, it's time to go on in some cases to final sand, which is gonna be 400. But since we're going with the metallic color, we gotta actually take it all the way to 600. And at the end, I'm gonna show a little comparison of why you would only go to 400 for a solid color and 600 for a metallic color. This cuts very easy now. You can see it doesn't take much effort with the 400. Time for the actual final sand. 600 wet with just a soft block. This is the part where your fingers turn into raisins. I know y'all at home probably can't tell the difference between these three sections, but let me try to show you. 320, looks smooth, not that smooth. 400, pretty smooth. This is good enough for most paint jobs. 600, that's smooth. Now, let me try to show you with the eyeballs. throw a little guide coat on there. I'll have to sand this back off, but. Can you see those? Fine scratches. Hopefully you can see those. Those are a lot smaller scratches than that 600. Almost invisible. They're still there, but they're very fine. This is the point of no return. Once you get to 400 or 600, you can still fix things like pinholes, small cracks. You can spot prime and sand it back down because you don't want to find out in the paint process that you got in a hurry or that you got lazy. So take a little bit of pride, make sure all the body work is correct before you move on to the next step, which is painting. Now I just have the rest of this truck to do, so. Guess I gotta get to it. Man, if I was nicer in school, I'd probably have more people to come help me. Just a day in the life of a body guy. 
Late nights. Next, we lay down some color, show you an easy way to lay down some pinstripes, and we'll wrap it up with some nice, shiny clear. Well, that took a lot longer than I expected, but we're finally ready for paint. The only thing we have to do is finish masking up the cab, and then we're gonna jam it, hang the doors, and get them aligned, and then paint the rest of the truck. Time to clean everything and then start spraying sealer. What we're doing is just making sure that we got a sealer and base on all the door hinges. Anything that's gonna be really hard to get to once the door is actually on the truck. Last bolt. Let's see if I got this door all lined up. It opens. It shuts. Oh yeah, I'm calling that good. Sealer and our main color is sprayed. Now it's time to measure out for our two-tone, which is gonna be the silver in the middle. Now there's more than one way to skin a cat. Some people like to do the smaller color first. I chose to do it this way. That way the whole truck had a uniform color before we actually put our silver down. And really the only thing you need is measuring device, the pictures on the phone that we took before we stripped the truck down, and some tape. 12 inches. I don't want to pull on it too hard, just enough. Oh, I'm good with that. This is going to get a red pinstripe, so I want the line to be clean. I like that. That looks, that looks pretty dang good. That's it. Everything's taped up. We got the overspray plastic on. It's pretty much time to spray some silver. We decided to go with painting our stripes on instead of the traditional stick on stripes. And that's kind of why I went with the order of which I painted the truck in. That way the stripes are not buried in the first layer of paint. They're actually on the last layer. Um, that way, at least if you feel them, it kind of feels like an original stripe would feel. But we already got this door done, so I'm going to show you how to lay these stripes on the bedside. First thing you want to do is decide on the spacing of your stripes. We're going to go with quarter inch and eighth inch. Now we're going to use the quarter inch as our border of the silver. And what I'm going to do here is leave a little bit of the silver showing. That way I know there's no blue. First stripe done. Now our spacing for our next stripe is gonna be eighth inch. Again, very close, but not touching. And then our second stripe is gonna be eighth inch. I'm gonna stack that on there as well. This is going to be our top border. Last layer, I swear. Now we get to peel the inner layers out. The bottom line. I like it. I like it a lot. All right, now all we gotta do is finish masking up with the paper and uh, shoot some red. This is the point where you can actually stand back and really appreciate all the hard work you've put into your paint job. 
probably have about 200 hours into this at this point. And let me tell you, I'm really satisfied with the way this truck turned out. Super straight, the color scheme, and I'm really glad that we decided to paint the pinstripes into the truck. It looks really good. Now that the truck's done, we can go ahead and give it to Mark so he can finish up with the frame. And before I go help him, I actually have a few more pieces to paint. Coming up next, we tear this chassis down and give it a fresh coat of paint. It's almost like we mocked all this up already. Then we give the suspension a lift and we start adding the powertrain back to this 85 square body. Finally, we'll put it back on all fours with some new rubber. This is gonna be one awesome ride. Custom little touch, you know? This has got to be the most iconic design ever. It's looking good. Sure is. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Mark Christ. We've got a new guy here helping us out at Power Nation, Michael Huxley. You're going to be seeing more of him later on. But for now, I want to focus on the project that we're working on today, and that is our square body Chevy. It's a huge day for us and this project, our frame, right here is gonna get painted and we're gonna start final assembly on this build and I can't wait. Now our frame, we sent it out to our friends at Blast from the past in Lebanon, Tennessee. They worked their magic on it, check it out. Blast from the past has been around since 1996. They are our go-to when it comes to anything sandblasting and powder coating. So we dropped off our square body chassis and they took it down to bare metal quickly and did an amazing job. We've worked with Vance and his guys for years now. They always go above and beyond what we want or need. There's no job too big, no job too small. Well, special thanks to the guys there at Blast from the Past. They always do an amazing job for us. As you can see, frame looks amazing. Uh, now, typically we will just let them go ahead and powder coat something like this, but being that this build is the way it is, this seemed like the perfect build for us to just paint the chassis ourselves, which is what? we're gonna do now. We're actually gonna be applying just a black chassis paint to this thing. Uh, and then on top of that, you can see we've got our mobile environmental solutions booth all set up here. Uh, the reason we're doing that is a couple of reasons. One, Brandon's still in our paint booth, spraying some of the components, some of the body panels for the faux guy here. So the booth is tied up and this booth is ideal for that. You just pop it up, use it when you need it, or you know, like if you run out of room like we have, or you just need something temporarily, it's the perfect solution. Uh, Michael, as you can see, is back there prepping the frame. I'm getting ready to go mix up some paint to spray on. Before you know it, that frame's gonna be black. You know, the most important part of any paint job is preparation. And other than the blasting, we're using Summit's wax and grease remover. I recommend using gloves because you don't want to get any oils from your skin onto the finished surface and you want to protect your skin from the mineral spirits that's in the wax and grease remover. Well, for the paint that we're going to be using to spray our chassis, it's uh, from Summit Racing. It's Summit brand. It's called Chassis Shield. It's a satin black chassis paint. It's actually an epoxy. You mix one to one with a catalyst. Uh, you can spray it on top of a primer or direct to metal like we're going to be doing here. Of course, you just want to make sure you get the surface prepped properly, which Michael and I have already done. So we just need to apply two coats and uh, we're going to have a nice black chassis here. This paint has to be applied in two wet coats with at least 30 minutes of flash time between each coat. It can be brushed on if you prefer, but spraying provides a nicer finish in our opinion. We're using an HVLP or high volume, low pressure gun with a 1.6 millimeter tip. Now we all know that I'm not the paint body guru around here, but this is one of those tasks that I feel comfortable attacking on my own. All right, well, the paint's dry on our chassis now and we've got it back in here and it looks fantastic. I uh, really like the way the finish looks, especially after it dried, it's got that nice satin finish and it's super, heavy duty, so it's gonna make this chassis and this build last a really long time. Now, we just need to get it bolted back to the suspension and uh, we'll be ready to start assembling this truck. Looking good. It's almost like we mocked all this up already. And stop right there. Mm. 
You about ready for this thing over there? Absolutely, bring it on over. You gotta go back just about six just inches to here. Come in on this side. Good on this side, yep. Up or down? Go down. There we go. All right, we're in. Let's move on, get the chassis up in the air and get that transmission installed. I'll be glad to have this thing installed for the final time, you know? <laughs> that makes two of us. Let's see, I see the dowel on my side. Wiggle it in there. These ARP bolts already lubed up. Mark, this is starting to look really good. Thanks, man. I appreciate your help. They got blasted and painted. Look at that. They look brand Restored new. Stored bolts. Well, thanks for doing the heavy lifting. I think this is the real reason you asked me to come over here. It really is, honestly. All right, down on your side, right there. It's in there. I've got a fuel system to run, brake pads and rotors to upgrade. I'll tell you what, I'll leave this with you. You finish tightening these up and I'll go get everything for the fuel system. All right, have at it. All right. Up next, we take a deeper dive into the fuel system upgrade that will rock on our new 496 Big Block. Well, things are coming along rather nicely with our square body Chevy here. Got the frame all painted up nicely, attached to the axles and leaves. We got the engine transmission transfer case back in permanently. Uh, it's starting to look like a truck now, which is really refreshing. We've got some things that we need to take care of next. Um, I want to get the accessory drive installed. Got some pads and rotors I want to do to upgrade these Dana 60s and the next thing is going to be the fuel systems. You can see we've got the uh, fuel tank already installed and the rest of the fuel systems right over here on the table. Now, a lot of times on our projects, and you can probably look back, pretty much everything we've built here at Music City Trucks had a big electric fuel pump, EFI, you know, same old thing. But with this truck, this was our opportunity to go old school, baby. So that's what we're going to do with everything you see here on the table that we got from Edelbrock. First things first, fuel pump. 600 horsepower capable mechanical fuel pump. Nothing wrong with that, right? Of course, we got all the fittings and the hose to connect the dots that we got from Russell. And then the coup de gras, this is the cherry on top. This is gonna be Edelbrock's brand new VRS 4150 carburetor. This isn't your pappy Edelbrock that he had on his Chevelle, I promise you. This thing, they knocked it out of the park. This is an all new carburetor. It's kind of the jack of all trades of carburetor, except it does all of those things really well. Let's talk about some of the features. This four circuit small carburetor is easily tunable with adjustability on the idle circuit, intermediate circuit, and high speed circuit. With two air bleeds on that high speed circuit, one for low RPM and one for high RPM. This carb will help you achieve your engine's maximum horsepower while maintaining drivability. The air fuel curve at wide open throttle is as flat as a pancake. And if you don't feel comfortable tuning, it's ready to go right out of the box. Just drop it on and go. Oh, it even has a built in provision for a throttle position sensor, which is gonna come in real handy because we're running that 4L80E. This VRS line is gonna be available in several different sizes. Right now it's only available in 650 and 750 CFM versions. We chose the 750, which is gonna be plenty for our 600 horsepower big block Chevy. It'll actually handle even more than that. Now we're not gonna be installing that today for obvious reasons. We wanna get the rest of the truck assembled before we do that. I don't wanna damage it, but I just couldn't miss this opportunity to show it off just cause I think it's so cool. Uh, for now, I'm gonna get this fuel pump installed and maybe install some fuel lines. All right, well, before we install our new fuel pump, we need to install this uh, fuel pump push rod because, well, engine power, when they built the engine, they had it blocked off. They weren't using mechanical fuel pump, but because we are, we've got to go with this. Uh, we got this from ARP, so it's gonna be super strong and do the job to drive that fuel pump. This is the lube they said to use. We'll get the push rod in place. Then with a little RTV on the gasket, we can install the fuel pump. It gets held in with two bolts. And then we can install the AN fitting. Nice and simple. 
When it comes to uh, running new fuel systems, it's about as simple as it gets. Uh, we just connect, this is the feed line that goes to the pump from the pickup. And this is a returnless system, so this is the only hose that attaches to that sending unit. Just need to connect it to the pump. Well, I know you can't see down in here because it's so tight, but uh, that's the feed line that goes to the pump. And all we need to do is run the line that comes out of the pump up through the filter to the car, but we're not gonna do that right now because obviously we're not installing the car, but for all intents and purposes, that's pretty much it for our fuel system, thankfully. Oh. This steering box is serviceable even with the accessories in place, but it's a lot easier to access now before we install them. Man, that looks good. Next up is the final fitment for the drag link, which now fits like a glove. This was such a creative solution. All right, well, that solves our problem here with the clearance between the track bar and the leaf spring. Steering's all back together, and now I'm gonna move on and do the accessory drive, and that's next. Coming up, chrome, chrome, and more chrome. We add on our accessory drive components. Well, we're plugging away on final assembly on our square body here, the faux guy. Went ahead and got this electric water pump out of the way. They installed that down in engine power to run it on the dyno. I'm sure they want that back, but we're getting ready to install our accessory drive, and we're gonna do that with all of this stuff here that you see on the table. This is one single part number from Billet Specialties. This is their big block Chevy true track setup that's obviously polished. Uh, this kit is a really nice kit. Let's start with the alternator. Uh, you want a good alternator? Power Master is the way to go. 130 amp, of course it's polished to a shine just like everything else in this kit. The AC compressor is a Sandin SD7. Uh, GM style power steering pump, nice and efficient. Uh, actually the AC compressor comes with this nice little manifold too and it points down to hide the uh, hoses so gives you a cleaner look. Uh, the water pumps in Edelbrock aluminum, high flow, the main bracket here, polished billet, just like most of the rest of the pulleys and brackets here, comes with a seven rib belt. And then of course all the hardware to get it installed, which is all stainless, even comes with uh, several ARPs here, which I like matches some of our other hardware on the truck here. The first thing though, to be installed, it's gonna be these studs right here. A little black RTV on these studs. One nice thing about this kit is the way the water passages are sealed. They use these O-rings, which makes installation nice and easy and prevents leaks. Put a little anti-seize on there. Time for the water pump. Then we can start installing the rest of the accessories one at a time. Another great thing about this kit is that it's compact and doesn't take up a bunch of room in your engine bay. All right, well, that looks really nice. Now, I would say it's a little too nice for this truck, but actually it's not because once the rest of this truck gets assembled, this is gonna fit right in because this is gonna be a really, really nice truck. Now, uh, I do wanna address the brake system next. And although I can't do the entire brake system, not without the cab in place, I do wanna upgrade the pads and rotors because I want that out of the way. I wanna get the wheels and tires on here because I already got the tires mounted and balanced. I gotta show you these. Now let's start with talking about the pads and rotors that are on our Dana 60 crate axle. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these. Uh, everything is fresh on these axles, including the brakes, but it's just OEM style pads and rotors. They'll do the job, but we wanna take ours to the next level and that's what we're gonna use this brake kit right here for. This is the Z36 truck and tow upgrade kit by PowerStop. Comes with pads and rotors. So let's talk about the rotors first. These things are drilled and slotted. Uh, that's gonna help keep the brake surface nice and cool. Uh, the slots will also help remove the gas, degas the pads, that stuff that's created from the braking process, uh, as well as the dust, pull that dust away from there so you have a nice solid bite. And as for the coating, you can see it's a really nice zinc coating that's gonna help protect against rust and corrosion. Now, as far as the pads, uh, this is a Z36 carbon fiber ceramic brake pad. So it's not just ceramic, it's like the next level, they've got carbon fiber in here. It's for severe duty 
towing and hauling or off-roading. Um, it's a really nice brake pad that's going to be minimal with the brake dust and still provide a, an amazing uh, stopping performance. The kit also comes with uh, all this hardware here and the lubricant, but we're not going to need that on this one because everything's still brand new. We just need to tear it down and swap these in. Pretty impressive. Now I'm removing the wheel speed sensors because these axles come equipped with wheel speed sensors for ABS from the factory. And we're definitely not running ABS on this truck. So instead of just snipping them and getting them out of the way, now's the time I can just unbolt them and remove them nice and clean. Whenever you're doing a brake job, like that rotor likes to kind of lean a little bit on these slip on style rotors. So when you're doing a brake job, you swap out the rotors, you can just put a lug nut on, even finger tight like that, and that'll hold that rotor straight so you can get the caliper bracket and the pads and the caliper installed nice and easy. All right, that's all there is to it. Again, got to do all the rest of the brake, plumbing and everything, but I'll get to that later on. Next up though, wheels and tires. Next, it's time to reunite this cab with our chassis. Add some wheels and tires and you're speechless. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. This looks amazing. Well, on any build, we all know wheels and tires can either make it or break it. And when you're talking about an old school build, that's especially true. And then take something like this where we're doing a tribute, we have to have the exact right wheel. And that's what we've got right here that we found on Summit Racing. These are eight spoke chrome wagon wheels. I mean, nothing screams 1980s build like these. They are 16 and a half by nine and three quarter with the eight on six and a half lug pattern for our Dana 60s here. To me, it doesn't get any better than this. And then for the tire, had to have a specific size, 36, 13, 50, because that's what uh, they ran on the Fall Guy truck for the majority of the series. So 36, 13, 50, 16 and a half on chrome wagon wheels. I think that's enough said, but let's talk about the tires a little bit more. Uh, these are from Super Swamper. These are called the IROC. So uh, they look a little bit like a regular Super Swamper would. They've kind of got that triple stage lug designed, uh, but with a little bit of a twist. It's a really cool looking tire and it fits this build really well. I can't wait to get these on here. I'm going to get them bolted on and get, make this thing a roller. I want to roll it back and really soak it in. All right, well, now this is not ride height because we don't have the weight of the body on here yet, but it's pretty close. Can't wait to see what this looks like when I roll it back. Oh yeah, let's take a look at this. Oh, come on. Yeah. I love that. I love it when a plan comes together. Wait, wrong 80s TV show. Either way. Um, Let's, let's just reflect for a second on where we started and, and where we are now. We started out with a mud caked, completely stock half ton chassis. Although impressive in its day, it definitely was not up to our standards for this build. After stripping it down, we blasted it and gave it a fresh coat of Summit chassis paint. The power plant is where the change really starts to happen. We started with this 305 boat anchor that gave us a whopping 160 horsepower with 235 pound-feet of torque. Then we slammed in this 496 cubic inch big block Chevy that makes an impressive 596 horsepower and 629 pound-feet of torque. Wow! The 700R4 transmission was ahead of its time back in the mid-80s, but it's not up to the task of handling that nearly 600 horsepower. However, thanks to TCI Automotive, we now have a new electronic 4L80E transmission. Then we ditched the half ton 10 bolts for a pair of one ton Dana 60 crate axles, a six inch Skyjacker lift, and some 36 inch Super Swampers on a set of chrome wagon wheels. This is what we started with, and this is what we've got now. 
Well, now all this thing needs is a body and we've got ourselves a complete truck. And thankfully, while I was busy doing all the greasy stuff, Brandon was busy doing the dusty stuff. And since we started with a really nice truck, we ended up not painting the firewall or the dash, just the outside and the door jams. That way, when we put this truck back together, it looks fairly original. And we ended up going with some undercoating on the bottom side to protect it from rocks and rust. Now that the chassis is done and the cab's done, I say we sandwich these things back together. Let's do it. The anticipation, as they say, is killing me. Well, now it's time to get our body mounts ready. We went ahead and upgraded to these polyurethane mounts. It's a really nice kit, but it doesn't come with all of the hardware. Uh, you've got to reuse all of the uh, the sleeve and then the washer, of course. So it just replaces the rubber bushing. This is an original one. Uh, you can really see the difference here, how nasty they were. Um, but in order to do that, I've got to press out the sleeve from this rubber. That's the hard part. Let's do that now. There's really not a great way to do this. So just got a pair of channel locks here on the rubber part. And then I'm gonna hit it with the uh, air hammer here. Well, that's the hard part. Once that's done, just blast these and paint them. And then they look like this. So now all we need to do is assemble our mount. Drop it in place. Down comes the body. Wow. Well, what do you think? You're speechless. <laughs> Dude, this truck. The blue and silver. Nothing screams 80s like chrome wagon wheels, baby. Well, I hate to say it, but this is Brandon's last episode on Music City Trucks. We wish him the best on his future endeavors, and maybe we'll see him down the road. Today on Music City Trucks, our K10 square body is making some serious headway. With our cab back on, we start installing the brake system, dive into how brake lines are made, I'll walk you through freshening up your AC box. And finally, we throw some exhaust on our square body. The end is in sight. <laughs> this has got to be the most iconic design. Hey everybody, welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Mark Christ, and this is our 1985 Chevy K10 square body. Now I get pegged as being a four guy, which is partially true, but something like this is right up my alley, especially when you couple in the fact that we're building an old school truck. But it's not just any old school build. This is a tribute to the hero truck from the 80s TV show, The Fall Guy. And I know it's not a GMC High Sierra, and it's not brown and gold, nor is it gonna be. There's nothing wrong with that, because this is a tribute to that truck, right down to the old school chrome wagon wheels. Now this truck still got a lot of work to get it done, but it's come a long way from where we started. Check it out. Well, what we started with was a pretty straight, clean truck. Although it was showing some age, really didn't need much work to get it in tip top shape. We threw on some upgrades to the normal wear and tear items, and then took it out to Woolies just to have some fun in the mud. Mission accomplished. <laughs> I love this truck. When we got back, well, it was teardown time. Once we got the truck completely torn down, then we got busy on the bodywork and the chassis. We added a 600 horsepower big block, 4L80E transmission, transfer case, a pair of Dana 60 crate axles, and had the chassis blasted and painted. We worked our magic on the body panels, getting them painted back to the original paint scheme that this truck had from the factory. Man, that looks good. Well, the last thing we did to this truck is get the cab bolted onto the chassis, which was very exciting. Uh, it does have the AC stuff still in here, including the uh, control panel, the pedals are here, and the wiring harness, but other than that, this thing is gutted. Uh, now we do have an entire interior coming for this truck from TMI products. I'm really looking forward to that, but that's not what we're gonna do now. I wanna tackle what's on the other side of this firewall. Now there's a lot of stuff missing here. Probably the most obvious would be the sheet metal, but that's not what I'm gonna do next. I wanna get as much done as I can inside here before that sheet metal gets in my way. 
Uh, mainly talking about what's on the firewall or what's missing from the firewall mostly. We took the AC box out of the way to get the firewall all cleaned up, which I think turned out really nice. We decided not to paint it because this was such a clean original truck. It's even got some uh, chalk marks here. We figured we'd just leave it like that. It's pretty much how it would have looked from the factory. Uh, so beyond that, wiper motor's missing, the brake booster and master, and of course the steering column, which is what I think I'm gonna tackle first because uh, that'll be the easiest to do with the rest of the stuff out of the way. Well, on a build like this, it's easy to forget some of the miscellaneous components. So that's why I go to Summit Racing for what you see here on the table as an example for some steering, braking, as well as the starter here. Uh, we have this mini high torque starter, which is for small block and big block Chevys. This is actually Summit branded. It even comes with the shims and the bolts to get it installed. It's for the braking system. This is a universal Willwood master, but it comes with the proportioning valve and all the hardware to get it installed, which really simplifies the build as well as all the hard lines. We're running all new hard lines here for the brakes. Copper nickel, very easy to move, uh, bend into place to make a really nice brake line. It's also easy to flare and it's not gonna rust like the factory steel lines will. And then we got an assortment of tube nuts here to get all the connections made. As for the steering, this is a Flaming River OE style column for a square body Chevy. Um, it does have a factory style uh, connectors on the electrical side. It even has a GM style ignition switch here. Uh, this will eliminate all of the problems that the factory steering columns had. So this is a nice heavy duty unit and it looks nice. And then to connect that to our steering box, this Borgeson uh, steering shaft, it's got U-joints on both ends and it's collapsible, so it's nice and safe. Uh, first things first though, I'm gonna get this column installed. Start getting this truck back together. All right, well now it's time for the steering shaft. Uh, this is the one that we got from Summit. Now it's long on purpose because it's trimmed to fit. We just need to get the U-joint installed onto the steering box, which we already got on there. And then uh, we'll mark it on this end, make one cut, get it installed. I always try to get the shaft flush with the inside of the sleeve here, inside the joint, but not too deep uh, because it'll bind up. Maximum engagement, no binding. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure just on this edge where I like that shaft to be all the way to the end of the steering column shaft, which is 18 and a quarter. Get that fully extended. And the next thing I need to do is just use a file to clean up the edge. With the rough edges taken off, the next thing is fitting it into the steering joint at the box. The reason why we wanted it fully extended when we made our measurement is because the amount that it needs to be collapsed is the same length that the upper joint needs to be installed. Time to drill. The reason we're drilling is because there's one longer set screw that needs to extend through the steering column and into the inside wall of the shaft for safety. Done deal. Up next, I'll show you how to make some brake lines and the tools you'll need. Turn the knob, spin the tool, essentially just keep doing this over and over. Well, we've got our steering system pretty much wrapped up except for the hoses and reservoir, which we'll mount that later once we get all the sheet metal in place because we don't really know where that's gonna go yet. For now, I wanna jump onto the braking system. You might remember earlier, I showed you we found this Willwood master and proportioning valve combo on Summit Racing. Uh, it needs a little bit of prep before we can get it installed. Mainly, it needs to be bench bled. That's why we have the vise here. Uh, but before we can get that installed, we've gotta get our booster. You guys probably remember Michael Huxley. Welcome back. Thank you. He's gonna be helping us out in the shop here for a while. Um, I guess that's the booster that came off the truck, huh? It is, it is. I just cleaned it up and put a fresh coat of paint on it so it looked like the rest of the truck. No point in replacing it? No, no, not at all. It looks great. You're a regular rattle can Rambo. I've had a little bit of practice. Looks good. Let's get that installed and I'll cut you loose on getting this thing ready. Okay, all right, all right let's do it. All 
right, while he finishes up there, I'm gonna go ahead and prep our master cylinder to be bench bled. Our unit is universal, so it does have ports on each side. We've chosen the driver's side because our kit comes with this bracket here to mount our proportioning valve directly to the master cylinder. It also includes these pre-bent lines to make installation a breeze. I'm installing these adapter fittings and hoses so I can loop my fluid back into the reservoir. That's ready to go. Then fill it with brake fluid. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and push this plunger in here. And what I'm doing is I'm watching for air in the hoses here. I'm gonna keep doing this until there's no air coming out of the hoses. You may get to a point where it may aerate, and that's okay. Just stop and let it rest. A good habit to keep here is I like to try to keep everything a little loose while I fit everything up so it makes it that much easier to install. Simply add the pre-bent hard line and tighten it down. All right, now that we've got the master cylinder and proportioning valve installed, all we have to do is connect the dots to our four wheels uh, with our brake hard lines, which I mentioned earlier that we got this copper nickel stuff uh, from Summit Racing. We're gonna start by sending the coiled tubing through the roller tool. That straightens the tubing out to make it easier to work with. To use this tubing cutter, I'm just gonna tighten the knob and turn it, then tighten and turn again until it breaks off. After it's cut, I just file it down a bit to get rid of any burrs. And that'll do it. Well, the next thing we need to do now that we have our cut nice and clean is to move on to our tubing nuts. We've got an assortment of nuts, but what we're using is a 3 8 by 24. This is very important. The tube nut has to go on the tube before we make the flare because if we don't put the tube nut on first, it's never going to go on the tube. So it's very important to do that. Well, we have to have a special tool to do the flaring, which is what this is right here. This is a hydraulic flaring tool, which is a little more heavy duty than the kind that you normally use with the hand crank. What's nice about this is it comes with all of the pieces that you need to do all the way from 3 16 up to 3 8 If you wanna do fuel line or something like this, this will work for that. We need to use this die to hold the tubing to the end of the tool. You want the end of the tube to be sticking through the die the same amount that the diameter of the tube is. We'll tighten the clamp, insert the inverted flare tool, tighten the valve and clamp it down until it stops. Then we can replace it with the cone and bottom that out. And there's your flared end. Well, now all we need to do is bend the tubing. And I wanna start with about a 90 degree bend. That's really close to the end here. And I'll bend it around this die. It's super easy with this copper nickel. That looks good. Now we're gonna make a coil in the brake line by taking a piece of round tubing. That's what I like about this. This copper nickel tubing is very compliant. The more compliant it is, the less likely it is to kink. And wrapping the brake line around it three or four times. We'll do four full. It's probably a little overboard, but it'll look nice. All right, well, got the end made here. And if you're wondering why I put the coils in there, the reason is because this is like a shock absorber between the chassis and the body because the master's mounted to the body and this end is mounted hard to the chassis. Uh, if you don't have that shock absorber in there, it'll put stress on the brake line and eventually crack it. Plus it looks cool. And it also makes it easier to install with that in there because you can move it rather than having a hard line that's right there. You can move it around a little bit. I'll snug those down later. Another thing too, I'm gonna to be using these uh, little line clamps that we got from Earl's. Um, what's nice about these is like I mentioned, you don't wanna to put too much stress on the brake lines. This will uh, clamp to the to the hard line and then attach to the chassis and that'll keep that line from moving around too much So I just need to get that installed and then I can get the other three lines done and We'll have a sub brake system Coming up next I'm gonna take this thing the rest of the way apart and clean the box up We'll make our AC evaporator case look shining and new. Well, that works pretty good. Well, we've got our brakes most of the way set up, so now what I'm gonna do is turn our attention to the other side of the truck. Now, some of you might know that this is a really hard spot to get to with the fender and the fender well block and these bottom bolts. So while it's off the truck, I'm gonna go ahead and look at our AC box here. A couple things I wanna look at are the evaporator core and the blower motor, just to make sure they're in a good working condition. After that, I'm gonna go ahead and clean it up and make it look good as new. 
go ahead and take this thing apart. Well, these bolts are long-winded. All right, at first glance, this thing looks pretty good. Now let's look at the rest of it here. What I'm looking at is trying to find any kind of signs of oil leaks or damage to the evaporator core, and this thing looks all right. Notice that this says 85 right here, so I'm willing to bet that this is actually an OEM evaporator core. I'm gonna go ahead and call this good, though. Let's go ahead and check out the blower motor. Now, just by looking at it, everything seems to be okay. The fins are not broken, and it does spin free. Here's a tip to easily check to see if the fan still works. Just connect the wires to a battery. Well, that works pretty good. It spins free, doesn't make any noise, so I'm gonna call that a win. Now, I'm gonna take this thing the rest of the way apart and clean the box up. I took out the blower motor resistor because I wanted to protect it from any damage that might occur. And this looks really good for something that's been probably on the truck for all its life. All right, now that I've got the mud cleaned off of it, I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing ready for some clear. I started with a red scuffing pad, making sure that I get a good rough surface. Skipping this step will result in your clear not sticking to your project. This might seem like a tedious process, but when you're finished with it, it'll look a lot better in the long run. All right, now that I've got this thing cleaned up, I went ahead and put a fresh coat of clear on it. I've replaced the seals. I even got a fresh coat of paint on the blower motor here to make sure that it matches the rest of the truck. So what I'm gonna do now is bolt it on. Well, how'd that turn out? You know, I think it turned out pretty good. It looks really good. Very nice. You ready to move on to something else? Yeah, what do you wanna do? Uh, how about you say we do the exhaust? I'm game. We just gotta move the truck up. Next, we custom fit some exhaust on our K10 square body. Problem is, we are not gonna get past this shift linkage. Well, we're getting a lot accomplished on our square body today. You can see our firewall is almost finished. Uh, Michael did a fantastic job getting our evaporator case all restored, cleaned up, and reinstalled. I went ahead and installed a brand new uh, accumulator on there, sealed it off so we didn't get any moisture in there. And then I finished off the firewall, did a coat of satin clear. We got a new coil on there. We got the wiring harness cleaned up and reinstalled, new wiper motor, vacuum canisters back on there. Firewall is basically done. Uh, brake lines are all done. Uh, you might notice our valve covers are different. We swapped out the ones that were on this engine. There was nothing wrong with them, but we just thought these looked cooler. Uh, these are billet specialties that we found on Summit Racing. I think it really fits the build a little better. Uh, and you might notice also that our headers aren't installed and they were earlier uh, because we ran into a problem. Let me show you uh, what we've got here. Now these headers that we had, there's absolutely nothing wrong with these hookers. Uh, they're a direct fit for a big block and a square body and I was really excited about using these, but there was one problem. Uh, being that square bodies would have all had the diff on the passenger side, you might notice the passenger side header is more compact top to bottom to make room for that drive shaft to go through there. Since we went with these Crate Dana 60s that have the diff on the driver's side, well, it was a little too close for comfort here uh, with the primary tubes. Uh, the drive shaft probably wasn't gonna hit ever, but with the suspension travel and everything, I didn't wanna take any chances. So the solution is gonna be these shorty headers right here that we found on Summit Racing. These are pretty close to our long tubes. Uh, they're the same size primary, uh, inch and seven eighths. Uh, they are a three inch collector, which is also the same, and they're ceramic coated and they look really nice. Uh, the only difference, which is the drawback, is that they're shorties, they're not long tubes, so they're not gonna allow that engine to make as much power as it really could. Um, within like 10 or 15 horsepower max, but being this truck is what it is, we're not gonna do any racing with it, it's not trying to set any records, so these headers are gonna be just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these installed and we'll move on to the rest of the exhaust.
All right, let's get this thing in the air. Well, we've got those shorty headers in place and it's time to move on to the rest of the exhaust. You can see we've got this true dual three inch stainless steel mandrel bit kit by Stainless Works that we found on Summit Racing. Uh, the only problem is we might run into an issue on the driver's side like we did with the headers, but we've got the solution for that. We've got a bunch of stainless three inch mandrel bent stuff from old projects laying around here. Of course, we've got a bunch of 90s. Uh, we got several of these 180 U-bends, which come in handy. And then, of course, we've got some straight tubing as well if we need it. But I'd like to use as much of this kit as we possibly can. But if we run into an issue, uh, we'll tap into this. For now, I want to start up front on the driver's side and see where we're at. All right, well, I've got the collectors bolted to the flanges here on the headers, and this kit's made for shorties, so it should just bolt right in, with the exception of this drive shaft being on the driver's side up front. So we need to do a test fit. I think the solution's gonna be to swap these tubes, being that this one has a big kink in it here to go over the transfer case. So let's move that to the driver's side. Let me give you a hand with that. Thank you, sir. We'll do a little test fit there. Good over there. That looks good. How's it look back there? Oh yeah. It looks all right back here. I think we got room. Problem is we are not gonna get past this shift linkage. I think we can just go ahead and just cross over here and then uh, go through this nice big hole that we have here. Just do two tubes and then mufflers and then maybe a Y into one tailpipe. Yeah, I like that a lot better. Okay, so there's a few fitment issues we need to worry about here our drive shaft, our flex plate, and our transmission pin. I've got this 180 degree pipe here that I'll cut in the middle, and that should give us a tight enough 90 degree angle to get us where we need to be. I go ahead and pre-fit the pipe to get the proper angle, and then mark it. All right, we just need to go from there to there. All right, be careful, it's still hot. <laughs> All right, so what we've got here is this mid pipe uh, that we had laying around the shop that I think is gonna work perfectly. We went ahead and cut those pipes off same length and made some grooves in there so they'll slide over the ends of this. Passenger side's all the way in, we just gotta get the driver's side now. Oh, really? I need to get a hammer. Wow, look at that. All right, well, I don't want to put this on yet until we get the bed on here, because we don't know where this is going to end up. Yeah, that and makes we'll sense. get a hanger on there, too. Okay. So I say we call that good. Now, the next time you see this truck, we're hopefully going to get all of the sheet metal on, maybe assemble the cab. What else? I think I want to hear it run. It's a good idea. See y'all next time. Today on Music City Trucks, we button up the front end of our K10 square body by dressing it up, getting it ready with some jewelry. We add new electric fans to cool this beast, and then we'll crimp our way to new AC lines. Finally, we hit a local chrome shop and see what they can do to our crusty old bumpers. most iconic design. Welcome to Music City Trucks. You know how these projects go? You get toward the end and there's only like 10% of the work left to do and it takes you 90% of the time, or at least it feels like it. That's where we are with our 85 K10 square body project that we're calling the Faux Guy. This is a tribute to the 80s TV show, The Fall Guy. And although we didn't go with the colors of that truck, we went the entire feel of the build and this truck is going to be awesome. We're in the home stretch. We're trying to get as much done under the hood here as possible before we get all the sheet metal on just because it's easier to get to right now. Since you saw it last, we've got the power steering reservoir and hoses installed. We've got our carburetor and linkage in there. Really all that's left under here is going to be like an air cleaner, some AC hoses, heater hoses, things like that. And then obviously the radiator, fan and hoses as well. And we're going to tackle those later on today. And the last time you saw us, we were installing our exhaust, so the underside of the truck's getting really close. Now we still have to set our pinion angle so we can measure for our drive shafts, and we also have to figure out what we're doing with our transfer case shift linkage. We'll get to that later, though. For now, man, look at this paint. 
This looks immaculate. We went ahead and cut and buffed it to give it that extra shine. Now all this thing's really missing is some trim pieces, door handles, mirrors, and some glass. So we're gonna tackle that first. Uh, now this truck was super nice when we started and all the stuff that we took off we could reuse. But with it looking as nice as it does, why would we do that when we can get everything new you see here on the table we got from Classic Industries. Now this is all the stuff that we need to assemble the passenger door. Uh, they've got things like the window regulator, uh, we've got all the felts, the run channel, uh, all the green tinted door glass, which I really like. Of course the tape to get it installed. And we've got the vent window and the rest of the seals. This is the door seal here. Uh, this is just a little bit of what we got to make this truck looking brand new again. And I think what we're gonna start with is gonna be this vent window. All right, well, this stuff is new. Obviously, we've got the seal here. This is our old vent window. We're not uh, replacing everything. We are gonna replace the seal, this frame, and of course, the glass. Uh, but the main frame for the vent window here, we're gonna reuse. So, first thing I need to do is take this thing apart. I'm gonna start with this latch. Save that. Let's get this disassembled. Don't need that anymore. This is the prime example of why all this stuff has to be replaced. Now we gotta get in here and pop these little tabs up. All right. I'm gonna go get this one cleaned up. Okay, we've got the main frame for the vent window all blasted and painted while that's drying. I'm gonna go ahead and get this assembled. We just need to get this vent window installed into its frame here. You can kind of see why we've decided to replace uh, the original one. We could probably restore this, but with this stuff being available and so inexpensive, I figured we would do it this way. The drawback, or maybe the difficult part, would be installing the glass into the frame, which you have to do with this glass setting tape, which is not a big deal as long as you can get past hammering on glass. We're using 1 16th inch, which is kind of thick, but that's what this job calls for. This is not a difficult, necessarily difficult job to do, but it's definitely intimidating. Yeah, it's a little, a little nerve wracking sometimes because it's not very normal to say, hammer on that piece of glass, will you? All right, that's done. I just need to go grab that frame, see if the paint's dry. Now we all know that builds like this can get really expensive really fast. One of the ways you can cut costs is by trying to salvage your old parts. Now I'm gonna show you how to go from grime to shine. We start with a buffing compound. This will get rid of those scratches and oxidation. I use a back and forth motion so that I know I'll cover the entire piece. Man, that's one handsome fella. Now I've got the base done, so now I'm gonna go ahead and put the shine on the mirror so we can put it on our truck. Well, we got our frame all cleaned up, looks great. Fresh coat of paint, I'm gonna start assembling. I'm using just some regular mild dish soap here to lube this up because it's gotta click into that, or clip into that uh, frame. Uh, I gotta get this thing seated in this track. It's tight fit, so we have to get the, in the groove on one side and then push this side in with the tool. A little bit of pressure, no problem. It's ready for the glass. All right, there was a rivet here uh, originally, but we drilled that out, so I'm actually gonna use some stainless hardware with a lock washer. So it doesn't come undone, but also is still able to move. All right, well, that looks like a brand new vent window. I'm really happy with how that turned out. We even dressed it up with a new latch that we got from Classic Industries. Now this thing's ready to go in the truck, but before I put this in, there's a couple of things I wanna do over here on the door. Now when it comes to assembling these doors, if you do it in the right order, it usually goes pretty smoothly. I like starting with the lock cylinders. Now these door handles are super shiny and you'll see why later. Next is our polished side mirrors, then the quarter glass, and then the door glass. Now patience is a virtue here. Don't force it and everything will fit real nicely. All right, well we got the door seal on here, got the striker on here, got it adjusted and tight. Let's give this thing a try. 
Oh, sounds so good. Uh, and it looks even better. Uh, we just need to go on and move on to the driver door, get it assembled, then we can move on to something else. Up next, we top off our cooling system by adding electric fans, and then we plumb in our AC lines. Well, we're moving along with our build. We just finished installing our radiator support, so now's a good time to talk about our cooling system. When it comes to high horsepower builds, keeping your engine cool can be really hard. One way we're combating that is with this frostbite aluminum radiator that we picked up from Holly. Now ours features a three row core and is made out of high quality aircraft aluminum. We also grabbed their high performance fan shroud kit that features two 14 inch electric fans that flow 2200 CFM. With the curved blades, they run really quiet. This all translates to, we keep our coolant cool so we can keep our engine cooler. Let's go ahead and get this assembled. Now we get to expose this shiny aluminum. I'm gonna line these up at the same time because I like everything to be nice and neat and tidy. Now we gotta mark it. Line these holes up, put your screws in. Always remember that righty tighty lefty loosey is reversed when you're upside down. All right, I've got my radiator in place, so now I can go ahead and install my brackets and hoses, and that just about wraps up the cooling system. Once the radiator's installed, we connect the hoses from the engine side to the radiator. All right, there we go. It's time to do the top side. Now I'm gonna wait until everything's dialed in on the rest of the truck to tighten these clamps down. But for now, I'm gonna move on with the heater hoses. You ready for this thing? Absolutely, I've got all the hardware ready. We add the inner wheel tubs for support. It'll start looking like a truck. We've already got our fittings installed, so now all I have to do is route these hoses back to the firewall in the best way possible. So I'm going to start with a three quarter inch hose first, and that's going to come off the water pump back to the firewall. Now that looks like that's where that wants to land comfortably, so I'm going to go ahead and cut that right there. All right, here we go. And then we'll tighten that later. And just like the three quarter inch hose, we're gonna do the five eighths the same way. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our air conditioning system. And because ours is custom, we do have to make our own hoses. And that's okay because we have everything here to do so. I remove the protective plate and take out these O-rings. So I've replaced the O-rings, now I'll install the manifold. I'm fitting these fittings in first so I can get an idea of how long I need my hoses to be. Our fittings are size 10 fittings, so we've got size 10 hose to do this with. And I like that right there. And once you're done, it's best to mark these just in case something moves. Now that hose is ready to crimp. Now this is a manual AC hose crimper. If you don't have one of these, you can probably rent one or get one from a local auto parts store. We actually found ours at Summit Racing. If you do, just remember, don't use an impact on these because it can destroy your crimps. We use a number 10 crimp on our number 10 hose. I'll tighten it down to make sure we have a positive seal. Just like that, you've made your first crimp. All right, now that we've got our hoses crimped, the last thing to do is install them, and that'll just about wrap up our AC heating and cooling. And man, I've got to tell you, this is really starting to look good. Coming up next, we shift into gear and install our transfer case linkage, and then measure for our drop shafts. All right, well, we are making some great headway with this truck today. Michael got just about everything under the hood all wrapped up. We do have a couple of little things we'll need to take care of a little later. 
Uh, but we felt comfortable enough to go ahead and put the fenders on and the emblems and it looks amazing. As you can see the beds already on there. We're getting really close and the truck's looking the way it's going to look when it's done, but we have a couple of major things we still need to do. One of them is figuring out how we're going to shift our transfer case, but we've got that solved with this kit right here that we got from JB Custom Fabrication. Now this is a stainless steel single stick transfer case shifter. Uh, they offer just about every kind of shifter for every kind of transfer case and vehicle, everything from Jeeps all the way up to heavy duty trucks, everything in between, and just about every kind of transfer case as well. Uh, you basically just pick the shifter you want, which we chose the single stick, and then you tell them which transfer case you have, and then you pick all of your accessories, like we picked this boot here that's got a stainless trim ring. Uh, that's like a vinyl boot there. And then we've got the knob for our shifter here that's got our shift pattern for our 241C, which is really cool. And then, of course, all the hardware to get it installed. It's got a heavy-duty cable, no binding or breaking or anything with this super heavy-duty. Uh, and it's going to be really simple to install. As a matter of fact, Michael's already working on that. Now, since we switched our transfer case, our drop is on the driver's side, so that's given us an opportunity to move our shifter closer to the driver. I've got this block off plate that I've made that I'm gonna to use to cover up our old hole and this template to draw out the lines to cut our new hole. So let's get started. I'm adjusting my template, making sure that when I cut it out, the shifter does not hit the transmission. I trace out my template, drill pilot holes, use the cutoff wheel for the bigger section, Finishing it up with a reciprocating saw for the tighter areas. Drop in the shifter, lock it down. For ease of installment, we're using quarter 20 nut certs and riveting them to the body. All right, well, we've got the shifter mounted. All we need to do is connect the business end of the cable here to our transfer case, and we're gonna do that with this little bit of hardware we've got here. We're gonna start with this bracket right here that's gonna mount to our transfer case adapter. We'll get the bracket installed onto the adapter, followed by the lever, and then the cable goes through the hole in the bracket. And washer. Then the rod end can be installed onto the cable and then attached to the lever. With a few adjustments, we're ready to lock it down. Looks like that might work. Well, we've got the weight of the vehicle sitting on the suspension. It's sitting at ride height. And now it's time to measure for some drive shafts. We need to take a few different measurements, including pinion angle. So we've got 10 at the rear, drive line angle, and seven here. That means there's only three degrees difference in those two, which is good. Drive shaft length. So I'm going to be in the center of the output shaft to the center of this 54 7 8 U joint length and cap diameter. And that should be everything that we need to order our rear drive shaft. Now all I need to do is go to the front and do the same thing. Next, one of the top chrome shops in the country is right in our backyard. Wait till you see the results. They are amazing. Well, I had to make a special trip up here to Portland, Tennessee, because I'm dropping off the bumpers for Fogai to be chrome plated at Advanced Plating. Now, this is their new facility. Well, new to me. I haven't been here before. They've been here about three years. Uh, since their place burned in Nashville, and uh, I hear this place is pretty state-of-the-art. Let's check it out. You must be Jason. I am. Welcome to Advanced Plating. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you, Mark. So we've got uh, a pair of bumpers for a square body Chevy. All right. And I even brought the door handles, the outside door handles. I'm hoping you can take care Absolutely, of those as well. Absolutely, we can well. handle that. What do we need to do? Uh, let's uh, get them, take them, bring it inside, take a look at them, and uh, we'll see where we can go from there. All right, let's go get them. All right. So what do you think? Uh, definitely, we can definitely plate these. No problem for you. This, and I would say, is, is an aftermarket bumper. It's probably not a factory bumper. That's what we were thinking. Yeah, but we have the ability to take care of that for you just as like if it were a factory bumper, no problem at all. Awesome, and then the, the handles. Oh yes, the door handles. So we can take care of those for you as well. Advanced plating has been around since 1962, but it wasn't until the late 80s when the ownership switched hands. With Steve Tracy's love for hot rods, it simply proved that this was the best decision to make. I had a 
neighbor that took me to a car show and got out there and fell in love with hot rods. Through high school, I worked at electroplating companies. I actually went to school for accounting, but my true love was hot rods. And I had an opportunity to come to Nashville in 85 and become part of advanced plating. Our business really rolls with the restoration market. I mean, you know, we get into projects like your project. And, you know, you have bumpers specific to your truck, and you're wanting to stick with those original bumpers, especially along the storyline of that rear bumper was put on there by that particular dealership. So, you know, you're staying in that original venue on restoring that truck. Not unusual for people to want to put their original door handles and headlight buckets, but there's some stuff you want to be a little more discriminating about to keep that personality of that particular vehicle, in your case, the truck you're working on. So with a newer building, bigger space, and more opportunity, Advanced Plating continues to offer more options and services to their customers. You know, we are passionate car people here, and that's really what drives it. It's not just me, it's the people behind us. Again, very humbling that people trust us with their passion. And that's what continues to drive me to improve. And that's why I'm here today. Well, they say chrome won't get you home, but who cares when it looks this good? Advanced plating knocked it out of the park as they always do. And you know, just a little bit of chrome on a build like this really goes a long way. And even though the truck looks to be complete, there still are a few things that we need to touch on, like the interior, but there is something pretty cool that we are gonna stick in the bed. And then up front, we've got something really special that we're gonna be doing with this chrome bumper. All well, that's gonna have to wait till next time. Oh, and this truck won't be doing any stunts, but we may have found one that can. We'll see y'all next time. Today on Music City Trucks, we decorate the living room on our square body, and we take our K10 back in time with a few touches straight out of the 80s. A real deal Hollywood icon shows up, and finally, we take this square body out for its very first drive. I mean, this is the kind of truck that makes dreams come true. <laughs> this has got to be the most iconic design. Welcome to Music City Trucks. I'm Mark Christ. You can see we got a new face here in the shop, Eric Smart. He's the newest member of the Power Nation family, and he's going to be joining us here in the Music City Truck Shop to help us out. Eric, welcome aboard. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here, and it is even better to look at this thing in person and see that it is almost done. We will be firing it up before the day is out, but we still have some really great surprises for you guys before we close the lid on this thing for good. Well, you came just in time because this thing's almost done. All the hard part's done. Now we're moving on to the easy stuff like getting this interior installed. Now, if you have a Chevy truck built between 1947 and 1998, TMI Products has everything you need to overhaul your interior. This is their Pro Series Sport R kit. You see the door panels are completely custom. We picked the colors with that red, silver, and black plaid and the blue vinyl to match our paint scheme. And they tied it all in with the red stitching. It looks really, really nice, but they do have off the shelf options as well. Of course, we've got a dash pad to match here, a billet steering wheel, visors, but of course my favorite part has to be 60 inch deluxe bench seat. I'm a sucker for a bench seat. And this one is at the top of the list. I mean, it's super comfortable. It looks amazing. And it's got all kinds of cool features like the backrest for the person sitting in the middle is actually an armrest with a cup holder built in. Now, what could be better than that on a long road trip? Of course, it does have a, an extra little uh, pocket here for your map or your uh, registration. But if you're gonna be on a long trip, all this extra bolstering on the seat bottom and the seat back really helps keep you planted and it's also really comfortable. I can't wait to get this thing installed, but before we get this in, we've got some other things we need to do the interior first. I'm gonna start with the door panels. All right, we're gonna start over here on the driver's side. We've got everything assembled inside this door, all the moving parts. We've got our door mechanism all dialed in and our window regulator, so it's time to put this panel on and we don't have to worry about it anymore. I even got everything lubed up. Now, TMI 
gives us this template because this new door panel goes all the way to the bottom of the door uh, where our original door panel stopped right about here. So just need to put this up there, tape it in place and mark it and we'll drill some holes. We're gonna make sure all this lines up and I'll mark and drill my holes. I really like this look of this panel. Okay, some final touches. I like that we switched that to black. Nice contrast. Last touch is this little die right here. Classic Industries had these. So with the rest of the interior looking as good as it does, there's no way we're sticking this back in there. It's old, it's beat up, and it just wouldn't look right next to all that beautiful paneling we've got over there. So we will be reusing our original gauge cluster and gauges, but it's a little bit dirty. So we're gonna get that cleaned up before we actually put it together and get it in there. Now, on top of that, we got a brand new bezel and crystal clear gauge lens from Classic Industries. Now, if you think that looks good, then you gotta know they also send you this if you feel like dressing it up even more. But, like I said, this stuff's just a little bit crusty, so we're gonna get that cleaned up before we put it all together. So, to take these gauges out, you're gonna use a quarter inch or a seven millimeter socket. I've noticed a lot of these trucks actually alternate between the two when it comes to these small dash bolts, so make sure you have them both handy. Now, we're gonna be reusing our original printed circuit because it's actually still in pretty good shape, but if you do need a replacement, you can get one at Classic Industries. Before you put everything back together, make sure you clean out the inside of the cluster and all the electrical contacts. Now that we've touched up our needles and cleaned the gauge faces, it almost looks like a brand new cluster. So we're gonna go ahead and put the speedometer in here and that finishes up all the gauges, which means that all we have left to get this thing done is screw them all down, put the cover and the lens on here, and then we're ready to go put it in the truck. With the cluster restored and fully assembled, we slide it back into place. All right, you ready for this dash pad? Absolutely. This thing looks good. The cluster looks nice. Okay, I'll go get some screws. All right. Time for the new bezel to go in. All right, let's take this little protective coating off. Oh, look how oh, good that looks. Gorgeous. All right, well that dash is done. Now it's time to move on to getting this floor covered. This is heavier than it looks. It definitely is. Once we added the floor padding, we made quick work of our vinyl flooring. We chose this option because this truck was originally equipped with one, plus they're super easy to keep clean. With the seat belts installed, it's time for the seat. We love the way this interior turned out. It may be a little loud for some, but we think it fits this build just right. Next, before we finalize, we've got to accessorize our K10 square body time machine. Well, we're getting really close on our square body here, the faux guy. We only have a few things left, but these are like key ingredients to make this truck what it should be. You might recognize this. What you got? And you got these right here, classic KC daylighters. Yeah, wow. Well, well, doesn't get any more 80s than that. I'm gonna start with this antenna mount. And I'm gonna tackle the roll bar and spotlights that we found at Summit Racing. So dr actually drilling into the freshly painted trucks not my concern. Drilling into the freshly painted truck in the right location, that's my concern. How's everything going for you, Eric? Not too bad up here. Definitely glad we put this bed liner in. Cause now I don't have to worry about damaging anything while I'm putting this roll bar in here. While Eric's working on the roll bar and lights, I'm running the CB antenna cable and getting the side moldings installed. Well, now the truck is fully accessorized. So am I. It's time to get the lights installed and give this truck a face. Five o'clock cannot come fast enough today. Jeez, this. 
This week, oh my gosh. Is it five o'clock yet? I can't. This week is just, oh my. Now it's time to get the headlights and turn signals installed so we can move on to putting in the new grill. You know, toward the end of the build, I always say that 10% of the work takes 90% of the time, it seems like. Doesn't really take that much, but sure feels like it. When you're at the end, you're like, oh, we're almost there. Just a couple of little things, just the grill and the headlights and the bumper and the winch and truck's done. Not quite that simple. With the outer molding installed, the new grill can go in, along with our brand new bow tie badge. Mm. To finish out this part of the truck, we're gonna get the headlight bezels installed and peel off the protective film to reveal the chrome on our grill. Look at that shine. Ooh, big moment. Really glad we went with this yellow finish on this bumper. Just kidding. We're just trying to protect this beautiful advanced plating chrome finish. Wow. That's chrome now. That's chrome now. That is the shiniest thing I have ever seen in my life. Now it's time for our Fall Guy style winch mount. Oof. <laughs> Things are getting real, real fast. Well, this is absolutely a huge moment for this build. And what would an old school build be without an old school worn winch? Uh, in case you don't recognize this, and you probably recognize it, but you might not know what it's called. This is a worn M8274. Now this winch has been made for now almost 50 years nonstop. Now they've done a few upgrades over the years, but pretty much this is the exact same winch that they launched in 1974. Uh, this is an upright winch with uh, a six horsepower motor. It's got 10,000 pound pulling capacity. Uh, and plus it just looks cool. I mean, you can kind of see the cogs here on the outside. I mean, this is just amazing. I love these winches. It's gonna look awesome on our truck. Uh, one cool thing that this one has as an upgrade is this synthetic rope, uh, which is pretty cool. So it's a little modern touch. Uh, we just need to get this thing installed and uh, oh, it's getting close. Look at that. We can't call this finished without adding these KCs. Huge thanks to Summit Racing for this, this other set of KC Daylighters because this whole entire winch mount and brush guard wouldn't be complete without the KCs on there. Let's get the hood on there. All right. Now you might remember at the beginning of this build when we first brought it back here to the shop, we put a brand new Duralast battery in it, but we're gonna upgrade yet again because we wanted to go with this one that's got the top and side post to help run all of our accessories like our winch and our lights. Now these Duralast batteries go through rigorous testing, both cycle tests and extreme temperature tests. So you know these things are in for the long haul. We just need to get this thing installed here and get this thing fired up. We got this Duralast battery from the AutoZone Pro website. Now this battery in particular has 810 cranking amps. More than enough for that big block. All right. Fire it off. Let's see how you did. Oh, listen to that. Whew. Very nice. Are we done? I think so. Yeah. We gotta check one more thing though. What's up? You think anybody still uses these? I do. Well, let's find out. Breaker Breaker 1-9, anybody out there? This is the Paul guy here. I hear you loud and clear. Did you hear that? Up next, we found a winch mount from a Hollywood icon, and you won't believe what shows up. No way. I mean, look at that thing. This is the Paul guy here. I hear you loud and clear. Dude, what was that? I don't know. Sounds good though. No way. Come on. No way. I mean, look, look at that thing. Just look at it. Wow. It doesn't get any better than this, does it? Well, obviously we knew this truck was here because we ordered this special winch mount from this gentleman right here, Kevin Webb, who not only reproduces Fall Guy winch mounts, 
but he has a Fall Guy truck himself. Kevin, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Now, this is not a clone, right? No, sir, this is an actual truck that was used on the uh, filming of Fall Guy season, uh, from mid, about mid-season two to season five when they ended the show. And now, how many of these trucks exist that were actually used on the, on the show? As of right now, I could probably, I can say there's at least two out there. There could be more, but two for sure. Two, including this truck? Yeah, including this truck, yes. Wow, so that's not a lot. No, it's not a lot, no. No, these, these trucks uh, weren't treated very well on the show. What is this truck? What year is it? This one is titled as a 77 because of the cab. It's bearing the, the right front end on it, but this particular truck wore different front ends during the show, depending on uh, how much damage it had received. And they okay. would change with other, whatever they had on hand, they would put different front ends on it. Like a lot of TV cars, they just grab something similar and paint it up to match yep. and send it out there on the set. Yeah. Yep. Can you open the hood? Yeah, sure can. <clears throat> oh, wow. I think something's missing in here, Kevin. Yeah, that's what makes it different from the other trucks. This one, uh, the engine that they relo they relocated it underneath the cab of the truck for weight balance because this was the mid-engine stunt truck. They used it, showed up mid mid season two to to the end of season five when they ended the show, and it saved a lot of a lot of trucks' lives because they reused this one over and over. Wow, you know it's. Pretty, pretty obvious that we weren't trying to create that truck, but it is very refreshing to see how similar they really are next to each other here. If uh, 20th Century Fox hadn't have picked the brown and gold as those colors, that would have made a good looking Fall Guy truck too if they had <laughs> had that. Why don't we go out for a cruise? Sounds good. Let's you go. down? Let's do Let's it. Let's do it. So how'd you end up with this truck? It kind of found its way to me. It was up for sale on eBay. And I had a friend message me one day, sent me a message with the link to, to the eBay ad, because I hadn't seen it. And they said, you need this. I clicked on it, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my goodness. So I went and it, the truck was in Jackson, Mississippi. So I made a trip down there with my dually and my trailer. and. Looked the truck over, it was what it was a, uh, advertised to be, so I, I bought it, brought it home. Yeah, so you took this thing from being purpose built just to get jumped its whole life, yeah. and you turned it into something that can be driven and appreciated every day. Yep. This, this has gotta be one of the coolest things I've ever seen. I mean, especially being a square body guy myself, nothing is more iconic than the Fall Guy stunt truck. Breaker Breaker 1-9, is anybody out there? <laughs> Are you following us? And I, hey, tell you what, your CB works, that's amazing. Yeah, I guess our CB radio works. I'm following some guy, I think it's Lee Majors in front of me. I was trying to get him to stop so I get his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll definitely give you my autograph, but I'm not Lee Majors. Uh, I'm a little more minor than that, but I, it's really uh, refreshing to see you in my mirror. And I thought that might have been Heather Thomas there beside beside you. Hey, hey! Be pushing that button. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his hair is gray, not blonde. Yeah. <laughs> but it runs well, no overheating problems, and it, it drives like a regular truck for the most part. It really does. I mean, that that's the most surprising part about it. You know, you you would assume dropping that weight all the way back to center, it, it would affect the performance on the road, but it really doesn't at all. This is like a dream come true for me. This is one of the coolest things I've ever got to do. Coming up, our K10 square body that we call Faux Guy hits the open road. That's my favorite square body ever. Well, special thanks to Kevin for bringing his truck out. That was really amazing, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I never thought I'd get the chance to see that thing in person. Yeah. And he's a cool guy, and he knows a lot about the Fall Guy stuff, which was an added bonus. Oh, yeah. But now I think it's time to shift our focus to just this truck and what it is on its own, because it does stand on its own. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is by far one of the most beautiful square bodies I've ever seen. And I can't believe that we built this. I mean, this is the kind of truck that makes dreams come true. Square bodies are pretty near and dear to me because the first ever engine swap I did was in a square body Chevy. So it uh, kind of hits home for me to, to build this truck. Uh, but if you look back at where it started, it was a really solid truck to start but it has come a long way from where we started. Let's take a look at the journey of the build of our 85K10 that we call the Faux Guy. We picked this truck up down in Fayetteville, Tennessee, and after some fun at Woolies Off-Road, we brought it back to the shop, tore it down to the bare frame, mocked up our new drivetrain, and sent the chassis off to be blasted. We painted the frame with some fresh black and started assembly with the 496 big block, 4L80E transmission, Dana 61 tons, a six inch lift, and some 36 inch swampers. Meanwhile, we worked the body over and sprayed it back to its original colors, and then it was time for the body to go back on, followed by all those finishing touches. And well, here it is all finished up, and I have to say, if we had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. I don't think so. I mean, this is the perfect square body. I don't care what anybody says. It does not get better than this thing. Well, this does a lot coming from a square body guy. How many of those things you have? Uh, three right now. <laughs> well, I wanna say, I know you haven't been here since the beginning of the build, but thank you for everything that you've done since you've been on board. Uh, you really came in and dug in here at the end when things were really tough. And I mean, look at it. It's, it's been my pleasure to get my hands on this thing. I still can't believe that I got to work on it. Well, not only did you get to work on it, but you get to drive it. Let's go. I got a ride though, cause you need a chaperone. You mean we can't go to Woolies? Not this time. Well, what do you think? This is the nicest square body I've ever been in, let alone driven. <laughs> I look at this truck and I say, that's my favorite square body ever. You mentioned this being a dream build. What's cool about it is if you're a square body guy or even if you just like old school trucks like this, this is kind of what you picture of like the ultimate truck, right? What makes this truck an 80s build or a period correct build? The roll bar I think is number one. The roll bar, definitely the KC lights on there and on the front. Chrome wagon wheels. And then of course, you know, no, no replacement for displacement. We got 496 cubic inches of Chevy awesomeness under the hood. I mean, that, that just screams 80s right there. There is nothing better than this. You know, it's got the perfect lift. It's got the right old school wheels and tires. Glad to have you on board. Glad you got to drive your dream truck here, bud. Oh yeah. <laughs> what do you say we head back to the shop and start planning our next one? I think that's a good idea. All right. We're probably out of gas by now anyway, truth be known. <laughs>